Good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I know we received RSVPs from audiences from audiences throughout the world for this conference. Uh, I'm Jisoo Kim, Director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. Welcome to the second day of the North Korea Economic Forum. Yesterday's forum focused on the historical aspect of North Korean economy. Today's theme is global financial crisis, economic aid, and foreign media. I'm so thankful to our honorable speakers today, former US Deputy Secretary of State Stephen Began for his giving for giving his keynote speech this morning, and the ALU School's Dean Alyssa Ayers for moderating his talk. I would also like to thank our presenters and discussants for participating in today's session. I would like to ask our audience to submit their questions in the Q&A box. Um, uh, you can submit them at uh, any time you want. And I'll, uh, now I'll have the honor of introducing Dean Alyssa Ayers. Dean Alyssa Ayers will then introduce Mr. Began. Dr. Alyssa Ayers is a Dean of the Elio School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Dean Ayers is a foreign policy practitioner and award-winning author with senior experience in the government, nonprofit, and private sectors. From 2013 to 21, she was Senior Fellow for India, Pakistan, and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations, where she remains an adjunct uh, Senior Fellow. Her work focuses primarily on India's role in the world and on U.S. relations in, with South Asia in the larger Indo-Pacific. Her book about India's rise on the world stage, Our Time Has Come, How India is Making Its Place in the World, was published in 2018. She's currently working on a book project tentatively titled Bright Lights, Biggest Cities, The Urban Challenge to India's Future, which is under contract with Oxford University Press. From 2010 to 13, Dean Ayers served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia. She received an AB from Harvard College and an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Please welcome Dean Ayers. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. I'm very happy to be able to join you all today and just sorry that I wasn't able to join yesterday. I actually had jury duty. Um, this is a really important conversation that we will all have today. Understanding North Korea is always a huge challenge for outside observers. Obviously, the country lacks transparency and accessibility. So the George Washington Institute for Korean Studies and the KDI School of Public Policy and Management with this North Korea Economic Forum Conference are offering a real service to the policy world by focusing in depth on the country's economy over this two day conference. We are privileged to have this year's outstanding North Korea Economic Forum speakers focus on the role that ideology has played in shaping and constraining economic policy and economic life in North Korea. I am delighted that our keynote speaker, former US Deputy Secretary of State Stephen Began, will be able to share with us some of his thoughts on North Korea. He had a rare opportunity to directly engage with North Koreans in sensitive nuclear negotiations at the highest level. So he's among only a handful of US experts with this kind of exposure to and understanding of North Korea's views and decision-making. I hope his remarks will also provide us with some fresh ideas of how to approach North Korean issues. This is in the context of a renewed discussion now on the stalled peace process on the Korean Peninsula following South Korean President Moon Jae-in's call for an end of war declaration in his speech at the United Nations last month. So let me now introduce our keynote speaker. We are so pleased to be able to welcome the Honorable Stephen Began, former US Deputy Secretary of State this morning. Mr. Began has wide ranging and extensive experience in international affairs, including government service at the State Department, the White House, and in the US Congress. He served most recently as Deputy Secretary of State, confirmed notably with an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 90 to 3. Prior to that, he served as U.S. Special Representative for North Korea. In that role, he acted as lead negotiator with North Korea and led U.S. preparations for the Trump-Kim summit meetings in Hanoi, Vietnam and Panmunjom Village. Prior to that, he spent 15 years at the Ford Motor Company as a corporate vice president leading international affairs for the automaker. I grew up in an auto industry family in the Detroit area, so it's always nice to welcome a fellow traveler in that regard. Mr. Began served earlier in government roles, including as Chief of Staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as the National Security Advisor to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, two years as the Executive Secretary of the White House National Security Council, serving as an advisor and deputy to former National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. 
He also worked in the early 1990s as resident program director in the Russian Federation for the International Republican Institute. He is an active board member for international, national, and local nonprofit organizations, including the National Endowment for Democracy. He graduated from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Russian language and political science. With that, welcome, Steve. We look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Ayers, or Alyssa, as I may, and, and uh, thanks for your many years of friendship and cooperation on issues, particularly uh, around this, uh, South Asia that both of us share a passion for. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning with all of you. I wanna thank uh, the George Washington Institute for Korean Studies. The scholarship from your institute was, was well known to me during my tenure as special representative in North Korea and some of your scholars mentored uh, some of my closest colleagues uh, on the negotiating team that sought to find a way to uh, advance progress with North Korea <clears throat> over my two and a half year stint in government, uh, uh, a recent two and a half year stint in government. Um, the, um, <clears throat> I know today's, uh, I, this week's seminar focuses significantly on the issue of economics, and I want to commend you for that because economics, uh, in my view, is an underappreciated part of the most, uh, the, uh, the finding the right recipe for successful progress and diplomacy with North Korea. But it's not enough in and of itself, and I'll, I'll get to that in the course of my remarks. In my remarks, what I'll try to do is frame a, a larger picture of the diplomacy that we undertook over the last two and a half years until the Biden administration took office to give a sense of where the opportunities might be, but also where many of the challenges remain. And so let me, let me start with just a very brief historical review of of uh, how we got to the point of negotiating with the North Koreans in, in 2018. Uh, I, won't, uh, I won't spend any time recapping the events of 2017, the rising tensions with the new president in the White House, fire and fury, little rocket man, culminating uh, in, uh, in much to the credit of the South Korean government uh, and much to the credit of President Moon Jae-in in an encounter at the Pyeongchang Olympics uh, late, in, uh, in, in, late in early uh, 2018, which set in motion a sequence of diplomatic engagements that led to the President of the United States for the first time sitting down face to face with the leader of North Korea in Singapore in June of 2018. But to give you some context for that, that meeting, which happened in June of 2018, was just one piece of a significant series of engagements between the two governments that started even before my time as special representative. Prior to my arrival in the position at the State Department in August of 2018, there had already been four senior level meetings and a summit in Singapore. Uh, I started my job as special representative in the aftermath of that. After August of 2018, when I started at the State Department, we had an additional eight meetings, including two summits, uh, for a total of a dozen encounters with the North Koreans, including uh, three leader level meetings, one in Singapore, one in Hanoi, and one in Panmunjom Village. Now I talk about my tenure having lasted two and a half years from, uh, from the summer of 2018 until the, until the uh, inauguration of President Biden in January, 2021. But really uh, the timeline was even more compressed because 2020 was an entirely lost year. Uh, in part uh, due to the diminishing prospects for success in diplomacy and the ambiguity that the North Koreans sensed around the United States presidential election, but also because of COVID most importantly, because the North Korean government completely closed down its borders as is probably well known to all of you in the audience today. Um, and so our last encounter with the North Koreans was in October of 2019, uh, excuse me, of 2019, uh, meaning that uh, uh, these uh, uh, 12 meetings, including three level, level uh, presidential level summits occurred really in the course of a year and a half. And that's a very intense level of engagement between the two governments. During this period, we were also uh, able to sustain very close cooperation with our allies in, the, in East Asia. Uh, uh, South Korea and Japan were excellent partners uh, during this diplomacy. And oftentimes, even in the face of areas of deep cooperation and uh, disagreement between the two countries, we're willing to participate bilaterally and trilaterally in initiatives to try to find a collaborative way forward on the North, uh, North Korea issue. Also, uh, I, I, uh, I think it's worth mentioning because it's so much out of context of these times, um, that we had excellent cooperation from the Russian government, uh, and particularly in the person of Deputy 
foreign minister, Igor Morgolov, and above all, we had excellent cooperation with the People's Republic of China. The then Vice Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs for East Asia, Kang Chuanyou, who's now the Chinese ambassador to Japan, was an excellent partner, advisor, interlocutor, collaborator, and the United States and China have probably never worked as closely on North Korea as we did in 2018 and 2019. Um, I say that because unfortunately the prospects for that kind of cooperation today seem almost impossible. With all the uh, engagement that I highlighted that took place over the course of that um, year and a half period, it's a fair question to say what came from it because meetings for the sake of meetings, of course, are not, uh, not of any sufficient value although they do build a familiarity and a dialogue that hopefully could culminate in some uh, diplomatic successes. I'd say that uh, uh, we have some things that we could certainly conclude from that period, including um, at first and foremost, that we tested a, a, an approach that the North Koreans have long advocated, which is leader level engagement to resolve the differences on the Korean Peninsula. I and my, uh, my lengthy fraternity and sorority of, uh, of predecessors as negotiators on North Korea, I've heard many times from the North Koreans that if the two leaders could agree, then anything is possible. Um, and for reasons that uh, might have been slightly different in the mind of President Trump and Chairman Kim, nonetheless, the two countries did test that proposition. And I have to say that my conclusion is it came out lacking, not because leader level engagement in and of itself was problematic, but rather that leader level engagement needed to be complemented by working level discussions that could narrow the gap sufficiently so that the leader level engagement ha didn't have to carry the heavy lift of the negotiations, but rather could get from maybe to yes on both sides of the equation. Unfortunately, um, uh, during the course of my experience, the conclusion I drew is that uh, the North Koreans, the DPRK, in fact, only wanted substantive negotiations at the leader level. And my guess is, that this was a calculation that they could convince the president of the United States uh, to accept a deal that would likely be recommended against by his advisors. And in the course of the dozen or so meetings I participated in, oftentimes in parallel with the leader meetings, meeting with North Korean counterparts in, in working level discussions, it became clear, abundantly clear over time, that those working level negotiators from North Korea had absolutely no flexibility at the working level to, to negotiate on uh, denuclearization issues and on the issues that they did have authority on. Um, the North Korean government saw them, I think, more as a distraction and perhaps even used their negotiators as cannon fodder to stall us at the working level while waiting uh, to arrange the next leader level summit with President Trump. Um, the uh, Singapore summit meeting that happened in June of 2018, I think it's fair to say, exceeded any expectations that the North Koreans might have had on what they were going to be able to achieve. They won the prestige of a meeting with the President of the United States of America. Um, they, the commitments that they made were relatively vague, contained in the Singapore joint statement that included four specific commitments uh, that the two sides would, would uh, continue to address. And I think the North Korean government uh, uh, left Singapore quite satisfied that that if it held the line and refused to commit, that it could advance its interests in the course of diplomacy with the president. And I think that perception or misperception actually set up the failure in Hanoi. When we came into Hanoi, uh, things had changed significantly. In fact, we had assembled a substantial negotiating team. The United States government had formulated uh, very specific proposals in each of the areas of the Singapore Joint Statement, seeking to add detail and breathe life into the general commitments of a permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula, transforming relations between the United States and North Korea, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and in the North Korean, uh, in the Singapore Summit Statement, the recovery of the remains of U.S. soldiers who fell in the Korean War, an issue that may seem at first look to be separate in a different in, an, in a different scale uh, of importance than uh, than the denuclearization, the transformation of relations, and a permanent peace, but in fact one that we transform into a much broader discussion about uh, issues of of uh, humanitarian assistance, of reunification of families, uh, of recovery of remains, 
and of closing the wounds of war on both sides and, and a, a, an avenue that we sought to open up to, uh, to create an avenue for humanitarian assistance uh, uh, to the North Korean people as well, uh, uh, justified, rationalized as part of a broader framework of, of humanitarian initiatives, which were undertaken not as a trade-off, but as a gesture of goodwill by each side. And after Singapore in Hanoi, we added a fifth uh, dimension to the Singapore uh, joint statement. Uh, in, in, in our negotiations, we put together a substantial draft with, the, with our North Korean counterparts of what we uh, in shorthand called inside the uh, uh, negotiating team, uh, the brighter future, but for North Korean consumption, we referred to as economic weight cooperation. And there we put together a, a robust set of initiatives for everything from international donor conferences to uh, exploratory steps for IMF and World Bank membership uh, for North Korea, uh, uh, economic cooperation in a number of sectors that wouldn't happen in isolation, but could happen um, in, the, uh, in, in the context of denuclearization and certainly significantly expand in the aftermath of complete denuclearization. So uh, we wanted a economic dimension to be very much part of this discussion. That traces back to President Trump's first encounter with Kim Jong-un in Singapore in 2018, when he famously uh, uh, queued up a, uh, a, a video that had been produced by, uh, at the president's direction that showed a black, grainy uh, reality of, a, is of an economically challenged and, and impoverished North Korea transforming in, in, uh, in cinema, in, 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 in great, with great cinematography to a bright colored future with gleaming cities like those that can be found in Seoul or in Singapore or, uh, or Jakarta or elsewhere uh, around the Indo-Pacific. And the president did this uh, in part uh, to tantalize Kim Jong-un to move from, uh, from the system that he had now uh, to a brighter future for his country. And we, we, uh, we sought to give life to that yeah, in our negotiations, but we, we did run into some challenges and the challenges uh, were not inconsequential. During, my, uh, uh, during an October, 2018 visit to Pyongyang, Secretary Pompeo and I held approximately two and a half, three hour meeting with Chairman Kim and his sister, Kim Yo-jong uh, at the Pekwan guest house outside of Pyongyang. Um, it was followed by a, uh, a generous lunch hosted by Chairman Kim uh, at the same location after a brief interlude in which a more relaxed conversation took place for another two hours between Chairman Kim, uh, Secretary Pompeo, and the rest of us around the table. And as I mentioned, we had very much at this point begun to envision an economic dimension for the diplomacy to bring the North Koreans uh, along in our vision, begin having them focus on the world as it could be, not the world as it is. And I remember at one point in the conversation, uh, Secretary Pompeo queued up with, uh, with, uh, uh, in advance in our discussions on how to lead the discussion, um, proposed to Chairman Kim uh, the possibility of this kind of a, a broader engagement in the global economy and asked uh, Chairman Kim if he had ever considered North Korean membership in the World Bank. And I will never forget the answer. After all the hours of study and planning that we had put in place in order to queue up this initiative, Chairman Kim, Kim looked at Secretary Pompeo and said, what's the World Bank? And that, uh, that sent us the message that we have a lot, a lot of work to do here. But we ran into another uh, more significant challenge than even uh, a lack of knowledge or awareness of how these international institutions work. And that, is, uh, that was described to me by a senior official uh, in the current South Korean government. Um, he said that the, the, the challenge is that the, um, the, the economic objectives of Chairman Kim imperil his political objectives and his political objectives imperil his economic goals. And so he can't reconcile a totalitarian dictatorship in North Korea with an economy that is increasingly open, uh, not only to its own people, but if you can imagine a reality in which foreign investors and, and, and free, uh, not free, but international trade with Russia, with China, with other countries around the Indo-Pacific, with the United States, with tourists traveling in and out of the country, if you can try to picture that, what we would call a brighter future uh, and reconcile that with the totalitarian dictatorship and the survival of the Kim dynasty, um, it's very challenging to find a way to reconcile the two. 
And I'm not sure that the North Koreans uh, ever did. However tantalized uh, some of them may have been in the course of these discussions, yeah, it, 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 is, uh, it is a clash of realities that may be impossible uh, to bridge. It reminds me of a, a saying that uh, someone once uh, 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 told me that uh, as, as you enter into negotiations, and this was in the private sector, you have to very, be very careful to design the bait for the fish, not for the fishermen. And I'm afraid this concept of a brighter economic future was a bait that was much more attractive to us at the end of the day than it was to a dynastic totalitarian dictatorship. The other things I think we would conclude from that period of, of negotiations is that while Chairman Kim was very forward leaning in many of his meetings with the President of the United States, when he returned to Pyongyang, he often retreated or even went into a period of protracted silence. Even meetings that I think both sides from the body language and from the, from the content of the discussions would have judged to have been successful and, and, and put in place uh, 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 plans that could be acted upon by the two sides. After the meetings, when Chairman Kim would res return to Pyongyang, uh, that the not only would the North Koreans go silent, but they would move backwards. And it did raise the question in our mind of whether or not Chairman Kim was facing internal pressures in North Korea. Then in the enthusiasm of the moment with the United States president, he would see a future for his country. But then when he returned to Pyongyang, the pressures from invested constituencies like the military, the nuclear industrial complex or party cadres may have pressed upon him uh, to a certain extent and led him to alter his course uh, uh, ever so much. With those conclusions, let me just finish Alyssa with uh, some thoughts on where we are now after three years. Uh, first, I think uh, I have to say uh, without um, uh, uh, unflinchingly uh, uh, and accept the criticism. Our diplomacy was not successful. Um, but what I like to say it has not yet been successful because I still do harbor a belief that this is a solvable problem in which sustained diplomacy can find the right recipe uh, to unlock a, a future of progress between the United States and North Korea. But in the meantime, we still also have uh, uh, the challenge of North Korea's weapons of mass destruction. And though we were successful in sustaining the moratorium, on the testing of ICBMs and nuclear weapons over the course of the remainder of the uh, previous president's administration. And of course, while it's a very low bar to get over, it needs to be said, we also avoided a conflict or a war on the Korean Peninsula, which seemed very likely in 2017. Um, nonetheless, North Korea has maintained substantial and improved substantial nuclear weapons and missile inventories, and very likely are continuing to prove upon those today. We left North Korea uh, and, and its regime under severe economic pressure, under political pressure, and under sustained international isolation, which we worked very hard to continue throughout the administration in order to have a buffer from uh, North Korean retreat while keeping open the possibility of diplomacy. We never relented on sanctions. We never walked away from diplomacy. And that was our strategy during the Trump administration. The sanctions have forced difficult choices on North Korea, but unfortunately, the North Korean regime has made it clear that it's more than happy to impose the penalties and the, and the real suffering of those sanctions on the North Korean people, all the more so with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has only increased the misery of the North Korean people as the, Korean government, the North Korean government has implemented the most severe uh, uh, restrictions on travel and trade of any country in the entire world. So what's the way forward? Um, it's challenging for sure. And we've seen a sequence of events that many analysts have interpreted as increasingly provocative behavior by North Korea. But I will say that there's a school of thought and I, I, am, uh, I am inclined to believe it, that as the North Koreans begin to do things as they've done in recent weeks, including critical statements and, and, and rattling the cage of the South Korean government in, in Seoul of uh, Chairman Kim, uh, uh, posing in front of an ICBM just uh, this past week. Um, the fact that North Korea is beginning to send external messaging suggests to me that North Korea is at least contemplating the terms under which it will re-engage with the rest of the world. It's very likely that just as the North Korean government was fixated on the US presidential election from mid 2019 until, uh, until November 3rd of 2020, um, it seems likely that the North Korean regime is also now fixated on the, North, on the South Korean elections 
uh, coming up in the spring of next year, which uh, could lead to a, a change in government uh, from the uh, from the progressives to the conservative uh, uh, politicians in South Korea. Uh, and the North Koreans uh, recent actions, including the reopening of the hotline with uh, South Korea may in fact be intended to set in place, set in motion, a, a series of engagements that could potentially affect um, political outcomes in South Korea next year. From my point of view, the most important thing is in fact a communications link. So uh, I very much welcome the fact that uh, South Korea and North Korea are directly speaking again. Uh, and I hope the case will be soon, if it's not already, uh, that the United States will be able to find a way to open and then sustain communications with North Korea for its part. It is one of the most significant challenges of North Korean diplomacy is the severe isolation of North Korea and the inability to sustain communications with North Korean counterparts over a period of time. The North Koreans turn that communication on and off as a means of leverage uh, on negotiations. And in fact, they even seek it to advance their goals in negotiations to receive incentives for the simple act of communicating rather than in a reciprocal way for taking steps that the United States or other parties are demanding of North Korea. Um, with communications, there's several places that I, I think uh, it's reasonable to believe that we could begin to build some momentum uh, in US-North Korea interactions. Uh, of course, humanitarian assistance has been uh, much talked about of late, and I certainly am in favor of that. There's no benefit to US foreign policy to uh, see uh, material suffering of the North Korean people outside of the, outside of the uh, relatively wealthy capital region of Pyongyang. Uh, and, um, but I, we have to be careful with our humanitarian assistance that it might not be delivered as a quid pro quo, but rather, at least my recommendation would be, we look at it as we did in our discussions in Hanoi uh, as, a, as a unilateral act uh, of, of, of a humanitarian nature uh, that also could be reciprocated by the North Koreans, but shouldn't be conditioned upon that. Um, health security, uh, cooperation, COVID vaccines remain a very important area for the United States to cooperate, quite honestly, with every country around the world, including our adversaries and, 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 and systems that challenge us like North Korea. But we will not conquer the COVID-19 pandemic until the entire world has a, a solution of vaccines and therapeutics. And North Korea is a very important part of that equation. And there's nothing that should hold us back from helping the North Korean uh, people be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Other actions that could lead to goodwill and produce momentum include uh, family reunions, not just the South Korean people, but Amer many Americans of Korean descent. Uh, still, uh, these 60, almost 70 years after the end of the Korean War have family members who they have not seen and every day the numbers dwindle as age and, and illness uh, affect the North Korean population and make it less and less likely that these family members will ever see each other again after seven decades of separation. Remains recovery, remains a potent emotional issue here in the United States, bringing home the several thousand U.S. Uh, Marines and soldiers and airmen whose, whose uh, fate uh, still remains a mystery um, is an important part of closure, uh, closing the book on the Korean, Amer uh, the Korean War of the 1950s. Um, restarting people to people exchanges, culture, track two discussions, and very importantly, sports. In fact, if you ask me what the next likely occasion is when uh, North Korea would engage with South Korea or perhaps with others, including the United States, it would likely be the Beijing Winter Olympics in February of next year, where the Chinese are pressing the North Koreans very much to attend uh, and bring a delegation to the Olympics. It may very well be the first moment at which the North Korean regime has the confidence in a pandemic world to allow its citizens to begin traveling abroad. Um, there will be some important distinctions in that that I'll turn to in just a moment. Uh, finally, uh, in the more substantial areas, the South Korean government is advocating for an end of war decla declaration, a political statement that, that su uh, essentially suggests that the state of hostilities has ended on the Korean Peninsula and in and of itself won't be legally binding, but might set in motion, for example, uh, efforts to uh, put together a permanent peace agreement uh, on the Korean Peninsula to fully end the Korean War and also to take care of other significant issues, including um, military demobilization, demarcation of borders, uh, development of strategies for shared economic resources in the waters 
that, uh, that, that border North Korea and South Korea. And those could be further complemented by security uh, and confidence building measures, as well as even uh, possibly the establishment of some liaison presence uh, of diplomats in each other's capitals to even uh, create a more sustainable and durable uh, diplomacy between the United States and North Korea. Um, you will note that as I mentioned these, uh, none of them get to core issues on either side and all of them should be attainable, uh, but they haven't been. And, and the reason that the topics I outlined have not been is because despite significant efforts, including at the Hanoi summit, to put together tentative agreements on all of these issues, which we did with our North Korean counterparts, uh, they fell because the North Koreans had one non-negotiable demand, which was the complete lifting of economic sanctions against North Korea. And that was combined with an unwillingness of the North Korean regime to commit to complete denuclearization uh, on the Korean peninsula. Uh, those, those two actions have to move side by side, as, as we uh, said in, in our diplomatic uh, construct, uh, simultaneously in parallel. All the other endeavors outside of sanctions and denuclearization that I described uh, could easily exp be explored to occur in isolation if the North Koreans are willing to, and I think they'd find a very willing counterpart in the United States as well as South Korea to begin to build that momentum through those places. But denuclearization remains the central concern of the United States in its diplomacy with North Korea. And the United States continues to insist that there will be no relief from economic sanctions until North Korea uh, commits and begins a process of denuclearization. To do otherwise would affect, um, put the United States and the international community in the position of subsidizing an ongoing nuclear weapons program in North Korea. A few other challenges uh, that we face, the COVID barrier still is, is significant. Virtually no, if any, North Koreans have left the country nor returned to the country since the onset of COVID in March of 2020. Uh, that makes it incredibly difficult uh, to say the least uh, to discuss diplomacy except through press releases uh, and announcements. Um, and, and needless to say, there is no virtual capacity to conduct a meeting or discussion with North Koreans of the nature that we're doing today. And we're there, so there would be very little willingness of North Korea to do so. Um, the DPRK uh, uh, is, uh, is still insistent upon sanctions relief, um, a, a, step that, uh, a step that, in my view, will not be uh, effective to jumpstart the diplomacy. It will have to come later. Um, the Democratic Public, Republic of Korea uh, has uh, edged towards increasingly hostile rhetoric uh, on and off towards South Korea and more consistently of late against the United States, um, including uh, accusing the United States itself of having a hostile policy on North Korea, likely but not certainly because the North Koreans, despite many uh, requests by me and, and my team, have never clarified exactly what they mean by hostile policy, whether they mean the joint military exercises the presence of the U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula, the sanctions, um, and, and for North Korean purposes, I think the ambiguity serves their interests because it's uh, it, it, it's a definition that they would like to have us continue to throw uh, possibilities at them until they hear the right combination, and then they can accept a, a, a sizable offer in a unilateral form. And lastly, and I'll end with this, Alyssa, there is one very significant difference that I think we should expect in if, if and when there's another round of diplomacy with North Korea. And that is that China will be once again at the center of this endeavor. Uh, China has become the economic master of North Korea. Uh, North Korean economy, which is in terrible, ter a terrible state, has survived particularly over the last year and a half, largely on the basis of the generosity of China with humanitarian assistance, as well as illicit uh, transfers of refined petroleum and illicit purchases of North Korean coal. These uh, economic measures are essential to, to, to uh, sustaining the North Korean economy uh, during its current difficulties. And it puts China in a commanding position to shape North Korean views. In my view, it is very likely that the restarting of dialogue between North Korea and South Korea, the reopening of the hotline was, was abetted by, if not directed by the People's Republic of China, uh, telling North Korea uh, that uh, to restart that negotiation was a was a uh, requirement to continue to receive the benefits that China's uh, pouring upon North Korea, and that provides the People's Republic of China with uh, with both the ability to control the tempo of diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula, 
but also to present to the South Korean government a tantalizing opportunity to engage with the North in its final months in office, but very likely conditioned upon Chinese expectations of how South Korea will comport itself in relation to its alliance with the United States of America, with institutions like the Quad, with new initiatives like the Australia, UK, US uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, submarine agreement, and also uh, perhaps in the future, near future, uh, in, in examining South Korea's relationship with the Five Eyes organization, which coordinates signals intelligence uh, globally. Um, it's very likely that any positive uh, impact that China has on North Korea's demeanor will be uh, uh, transactionally marketed uh, to the South Koreans uh, as an opportunity to choose a different course than the United States might want South Korea to choose. And therein lie the seeds of other challenges that the United States will have to manage its way through, not only on North Korea policy, but in the greater Indo Pacific in the months and years ahead. Um, I'll leave it at that, Alyssa. I'm more than happy to answer any questions from your uh, from your other speakers or participants. Thank you so much. I, I have to say, in some ways, this is kind of a, a bleak message that you've brought here this morning. Um, let me follow up on something that you offered in your remarks. Thank you. And then we do have a number of questions that have come in. We'll see how many we can get to. Um, having had this experience of leading negotiations with them, you observed that part of the challenge was they really did not want to have the working level carry out some of the, the kind of technical negotiating that needs to take place before you get to the summit level. This is a structural problem, right? If you can't work things out before you get to the summit level, what can you do at the summit level? But if they only want to have negotiations at the summit level, it seems that it's impossible to advance. Um, reflecting on this pattern, I mean, what would you suggest as a, as a kind of structure for trying to get to a next step? The, um, I, I don't think this works unless you get to that level of, of detail, um, but it, it, I also have to acknowledge that it's an extraordinary challenge uh, for North Korea. So, you know, when, in the 1970s and in the 1980s, when the United States would negotiate arms control agreements with the Soviet Union in places like Vienna or Switzerland, each side would send an army of negotiators with subgroups and particular tactical expertise. And, and, uh, and, and this is you know, very much the, the great power model for this level of engagement. But North Korea doesn't have that human or technical uh, capability. They've got, of course, very capable people. They demonstrated the ability to master uh, splitting of the atom and the development of a nuclear weapon. So I'm not underselling uh, the, the level of capability uh, in North Korea, but it's the bandwidth that they're mm -hmm. lacking. You know, in a perfect world, the way we would have structured the diplomacy has had a separate line of, of negotiations for each of the four commitments. And the fifth included when we added uh, uh, economic cooperation in Hanoi to have a, a separate working group for each of those. But uh, my experience and many of your viewers experience, many of the participants here experience with North Korea would su suggest that, that the North Korean regime would find that completely intolerable because they couldn't assert control over such a breadth of discussions in various areas. Uh, that was, that did underpin our concept of, of, of parallel and simultaneous, that we could have a team negotiating a peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula. At the same time, we had a, a, um, a uh, economic dialogue being led by economists and experts and aid groups and international institutions at the same time that we were designing humanitarian and people-to-people -people, uh, uh, exchanges that, to generate goodwill. You know, conceptually, it, it looks great, but um, you know, it, it, in practice, it would be extraordinarily difficult uh, for the North Koreans to do it. You know, at the end of the day, um, what the North Koreans showed up with the meeting at the meetings with is what we had to work with. Um, mm -hmm. I had uh, actually during the course of my meetings with the North Koreans, I never sat across from the same set of interlocutors more than one or two times. It was a constantly rotating cast. And I have to tell you, uh, uh, I even, uh, you know, having formed a human connection and participated in, in some cases, days long engagements with these people, trying to understand better, you know, their position and their thinking. Um, 
I even uh, had moments to be concerned about their fate at the end of these negotiations because we did we did have a a very robust and ambitious and flexible offer for the North Koreans, but they had to show up. They had to make commitments on denuclearization, which were the centerpiece of this for the President of the United States and for all of the United States government. Uh, they we we internally set a metric that when we started seeing uniforms at the negotiations, it would be a suggestion to us that the North Koreans were getting more serious about talking about the core issues. And I will tell you, Alyssa, in the two and a half years, I never once saw a uniform at a meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got um, a number of questions that have come in. I know your time is limited, so let's see if we can get a couple in before we need to wrap. We've got one from Unjun Cho with Voice of America. This question is, President Moon again proposed an end of war declaration. Secretary Began, do you agree with his idea that such a declaration can create an opening for confidence building and peace? Is an end of war declaration something you would encourage pursuing before full-fledged denuclearization negotiations? So uh, yes, but not in isolation. Uh, you know, I, I have seen the uh, I have seen the more skeptical uh, assessments of what an end of war declaration would mean, including those that uh, suggest that it might undermine the defense commitment the United States uh, has to South Korea or South Korea's commitment to the alliance or in the worst case, underline, uh, even undermine the legal underpinnings of the US security uh, relationship with North, uh, with South Korea. I find all those, those points to be uh, relatively easy to, uh, those concerns relatively easy to address. A, an end of war declaration would be a political statement. It, it wouldn't fundamentally alter the legal basis for US forces on the Korean Peninsula. And, 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 uh, and to suggest otherwise is in defiance of the US uh, uh, defense guarantees to our European allies in NATO, to our partners in Australia, in Japan. Um, the, the alliance in South Korea uh, had its birth in the aftermath of the Korean War, but its legal founding is based upon the commitment of two sovereign democracies uh, to, uh, to mutually defend each other's interests. And as long as that commitment is sustained between the Republic of Korea and the United States of America, uh, the alliance uh, will be in good shape. And I think we have ample evidence in the very near past by President Biden's successful conclusion of the burden sharing arrangements in the, in the US ROK alliance uh, that both sides are still deeply committed to that alliance. Uh, the end of war declaration shouldn't be exaggerated. It's not legally binding, it's a, it's a political statement. But were it part of a sequence of steps or a combination of actions that each side could take to begin to build momentum, I think it would play a very important role. But I, I do want to caveat that where I, where I am worried a little bit, and, and, and I had a great relationship with the unification ministers uh, across uh, three different ministers uh, during my time as, uh, as North Korea representative. And we talk about these issues uh, candidly and, and, and collaboratively that my view is that, that North Koreans will not be in, enticed or induced to coming to the table simply by throwing concessions at them. Now, um, you know, the Biden administration uh, uh, in whom I, I have a lot of confidence that uh, were they given the opportunity would pursue uh, uh, those opportunities with the North Koreans uh, frequently resorts to a, a statement uh, uh, which is that they will meet the North Koreans uh, anytime, anywhere without conditions. I, I have to tell you my experience is the North Koreans hate that kind of open-ended um, uh, suggestion. I, I remember one of my colleagues on the National Security Council staff in the Bush administration came back frustrated from New York, having offered to the North Koreans an unconditional negotiation and the North Korean ambassador accused him of putting conditions on the negotiation <laughs> by making them unconditional. Um, uh, what we need to do is quietly work through a series of steps that both sides could take, including potentially an end of war declaration um, that could be part of a package. But in isolation, um, I don't think it does the trick, Alyssa. We've got a question from one of our panelists from Bill Brown that follows up on um, some of the threads of this conversation. He asks, other than sanctions relief, could you discern any other specific economic needs they were interested in, for instance, in opening tourism? Yeah, so, um, 
it, it, certainly uh, the issues of, of Kumgang, Kumgang, Mount Kumgang uh, tourism and Kaesong came up. And I, I will tell you candidly, Bill, that we were, we, we had, uh, we had considered and we had priced for these things and we thought about how we could do them. And we had some, we wanted, we wanted, and by the way, the North Koreans were willing to accept snapbacks. In the event that we began uh, a substantive process of denuclearization, conceptually, the North Koreans did not seem to oppose the idea of snapbacks, which would be a lot easier with Mount Kumgang than with the Kaesong Industrial Complex. But we did talk uh, generally about both of those, but we never offered either of them because we never got to the point where the North Koreans were willing to make the commitments we with in order to, to make progress. Um, you know, uh, my first visit to, my second visit to Pyongyang was in, in uh, January of 2019. And that's when we first laid out this notion of a brighter economic future, which for sensible reasons, we recast as economic cooperation, recognizing that that the the necessities of North Korean negotiators to defend Juche, to defend self-reliance, would make anything that suggests North Korea already is in a paradise on earth uh, an insult. And so what we want to talk about is economic cooperation, which I think was more politically palatable. Um, and while I was initially subject uh, to a lecture of how many kindergartens the marshal had opened in North Korea since ascending uh, uh, his position as leader of North Korea uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a, a six years before. Um, in fact, over the course of time, when presented as cooperation, uh, the North Koreans seemed very interested in it. And my anecdote, not, anecdote notwithstanding about the World Bank, um, it seems to me that there would be a real advantage in helping the North Korean regime, if not the people understand what the potential opportunities are in economics, even in advance of delivering them. So we had envisioned, for example, uh, an international economic conference on North Korea that the North Koreans would be observers at, but not participants initially. In that case, they get a, get a sense of how committed the world was to helping North Korea peacefully transform itself into a uh, into a a, a, a more uh, uh, a survivable economy, uh, much less political system. And then later to engage the North Koreans as diplomacy advanced on other core issues like denuclearization and actually shaping the outcome of those discussions. You know, our ambitions were enormous, uh, including in the economic area. And we were willing to explore this with the exception that it would not be done without progress uh, and, and a, a North Korean commitment to complete denuclearization. Um, to do otherwise, we felt would put us in a position of underwriting an ongoing nuclear weapons program. We've got seven questions and no time left. Uh, Jisoo, do you think we have time for just one last question? Because there are so many good ones here. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, one last question. One last question. Okay, H here is a question from Matthew Ferguson. He writes, it is inconceivable that North Korea will give up nuclear weapons. They see them as their only bargaining chip against foreign interference. Is pressing for denuclearization the right approach toward peace in Korea, given that it merely antagonizes the North? Has this approach led to any substantial lasting peace? I mean, that kind of gets to the heart of, of what should be the focus. Yeah, yeah, Matthew, it, it's, it's obviously uh, uh, the central question. And, and, uh, and I, I, let me answer it in three ways. Uh, first, we saw the denuclearization in it as an iterative process. Just as you would describe what is inconceivable today, so too would likely many North Korean um, many North Korean officials. But our goal was to set in motion over time, an iterative process by which what was inconceivable and what was conceivable began to change in time. If we could eliminate the hostility that existed on the Korean Peninsula, if we begin to uh, incentivize an, ec a, a, an, an economic relationship with North Korea, if we be could begin to broaden the aperture of North Korean engagement with the rest of the world, our hope was that we could also begin to to make progress on things that today seemed inconceivable, um, such as complete denuclearization. Now, the North Koreans did offer some steps on denuclearization. They offered the complete elimination of the Yongbyon uh, facility, including all the attendant parts of that. They offered that in the Hanoi summit, but the challenge there was they were unwilling to give us the other piece of that, which was a commitment that at the end of the day, that that would only be the first step in a series of steps that at some point would lead to the complete denuclearization of North Korea. 
Um, it did commit them up front to do that, uh, but it set in motion a sequence where this iterative process could work. The second challenge that uh, that I, I would say we have uh, here is that um, that as a political reality, it would be impossible for the United States of America uh, to lift sanctions against North Korea with uh, with an active uh, and illicit nuclear weapons program. So just as it is inconceivable to achieve this with North Korea, it's inconceivable in the US political system and in many countries around the world to not achieve this. Um, so it is a it is an intractable issue. And the third uh, and, uh, issue and one that weighed uh, uh, very much on me is that to accept North Korea implicitly or explicitly as a permanent nuclear weapons state would, as I told my Chinese interlocutors many times, suggest that this will not be the last country in East Asia that will likely develop its nuclear weapons capability. How could South Korea, how could future generations of South Korean governments um, not respond to the presence of nuclear weapons uh, in North Korea uh, without contemplating developing their own deterrent? And not just North, South Korea, but Japan and other countries in the region as well in time. And so, um, you know, the battle for nonproliferation uh, uh, is, is a series of strategic fallbacks. Alyssa and I worked together very much on trying to reconcile an India's nuclear weapons program with a, with a modernizing relationship with, with India. Um, uh, with North Korea, I'm afraid to accept them as a nuclear weapons state implicitly or explicitly would guarantee the, the expansion of nuclear weapons states in East Asia in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, your honest appraisal, uh, your reflections of your experiences as the senior representative, um, and for your willingness to take questions and, and answer them very frankly. Um, I hope everybody will join me in thanking you, uh, Stephen, for your time with us this morning, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversations today. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you all. Good luck with your uh, conference today. I appreciate the time. Jisoo, back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kagan, for sharing your insightful views. Uh, that was virtually um, helpful. And thanks so much, Alyssa, for uh, moderating this uh, panel. And thank you so much for your time once again. Now, I would like to turn it over to um, Bill Newcomb, who is the moderator of the second session. Oh, thank you very much, Jisoo. And I want to once again thank the uh, uh, Institute at GW, as well as the KDI School of Public Policy for supporting this third conference. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to uh, have the opportunity to moderate a, a session of what I find to be three really excellent papers. We're going to present the papers first, and then we'll follow up with the discussants so that we can try perhaps to integrate uh, the various topics of this session. Now, our presenters and discussants, uh, there are thumbnail biographies uh, in the program. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, particularly to preserve time for questions at the end, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction one by one as, as we get into the presentations. Our first paper, is going to be on the failure of North Korean development aid in Africa. Uh, it's presented by Tucko Vanderhoek. He's a PhD student at Lincoln University. Um, and uh, my, my past experience uh, seeing him uh, discuss this topic, uh, he, he's probably done deeper research than anyone else I know on this area. Uh, Tycho, why don't you lead off, please? Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from the Republic of Leiden. Um, I want to thank you for hosting me today. Um, it's really an honor. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Um, as most of you have will know, uh, yesterday's panel mainly looked at the domestic strategy of North Korea for market development. Uh, but today I want to do the exact opposite and actually look at the international strategy uh, of North Korea's um, plans for, for economic development. Um, in the past years, there's been a, really a host of, of research been done on proving 
the ties of the DPRK to the rest of the world. Uh, I think this is a very successful and growing field of, of expertise. And some of the approaches that, that have been used by scholars are, for example, a focus on high level political exchanges between Kim Il Sung and uh, leaders from uh, independent countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, another example is, of course, uh, Tucci and the importance of ideology. And I will talk a little bit more about this uh, at a later stage in the presentation. Military cooperation is obviously a, a big part of North Korean foreign policy. And it's very difficult to miss the monuments, statues, cemeteries, and other buildings that are being constructed by North Korean laborers all around the world. Yet the issue of development aid as such remains a blind spot in the field. Um, there, has, there hasn't been anything really comprehensive written on it yet. And I think one of the explanations for this blind spot is the fact that in this field, scholars desperately try to prove the success of North Korean foreign policy by going against the public image of the DPRK as a hermit kingdom. And there's much value to this. Uh, but as I will show you, development aid was actually a big part of North Korean foreign policy. A second explanation is perhaps a lack of sources. It's simply quite difficult to unearth some of the stories that are part of this, of this global strategy. Um, I've been only been able to, um, to write this paper after extensive fieldwork in Britain, South Korea and Namibia where local archival repositories hold um, recently declassified uh, diplomatic cables and other types of archive materials that are really novel and, and, and fruitful for, for research. In this presentation, I want to focus on a case study of Ghana and Tanzania. And I want to look at Juche as a developmental model and I think this is an ideal place. It's an intersection of North Korean ideology and economy. So it is well suited for this conference. And although it is located in the past, um, I don't think development aid of, in North Korea, of North Korea is really a, a vital uh, part of, of its foreign policy today. It is still useful to examine it, um, even so because it's, it's failed. Um, as I said before, we try to look at, at successful examples of North Korean ties to the world, but a failed relationship is also a relationship and therefore worth studying. I apologize for um, the massive text in this uh, PowerPoint slide, but these conference titles are always dreadfully long. So please bear with me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about aid as foreign policy before I go to the case study. There is a distinct relationship between North Korean aid and North Korean foreign policy. And I believe that the 1980s really was a decade of giving aid, especially to Africa. And in this regard, a speech of Kim Il-sung, which was called for the development of agriculture in African countries is really quite important. He presented this speech in 1981 in a conference in Pyongyang, uh, where he invited a lot of agricultural ministers and other high level political elites um, from African countries, but also other parts of the world. And I think that 1981 is therefore sort of the, the kickstart, the kickoff um, of North Korean development aid in the world. And after this year, we see a host of activities being undertaken in, in various countries. I also think that this was part of a, uh, a campaign that was building up to a conference in 1987, which is called the Extraordinary Ministerial Conference of the Non-Aligned Movement on South-South Cooperation. And this was really a chance for DPRK to present themselves on the world stage as a beacon for the non-aligned countries uh, and presenting a blueprint essentially for a way forward of which agriculture was a big part. The role of the non-land movement is, is very important in this, uh, particularly because South Korea was not a member of the NAM. 
So this was an ideal venue for the DPRK to uh, find allies and to, 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 to look for, uh, for a strategy that could really rally um, African countries you know, behind their foreign policy objectives. And the ultimate objective of, was, of course, uh, a majority in the General Assembly in the United Nations, where they were trying to isolate South Korea as much as possible. So this geopolitical background is really quite important to understand the, the, the use of development aid as a foreign policy tool. It's inevitable that there is also a link to uh, Tuchia, which is, I think, very interesting in the context of development aid, because aid is essentially a means to transform a society, often uh, with the standards of the donor country in mind. Um, Tuchia is often translated as self-reliance, and this appeal to a lot of independent African uh, political elites. There are recorded stories of, of African presidents that are traveling to Pyongyang, and they are explaining that Tuchia is very compatible with their indigenous political philosophies that they were using to, um, to develop their post-independent countries. Examples are Sretsekana of Botswana and Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, two really important figures in, in African independence that specifically said that Tutsi was something that they could use also in their home countries. Tutsi as such was not um, um, a strange phenomenon for Africans, which is not only related to these political exchanges, but also to the use of Tutsi study centers in Africa. And these were ideological institutes funded by the DPRK, where regular Africans could come to and um, go to seminars, watch film screenings, and also read uh, literature, North Korean literature that was translated into French, English, uh, Swahili, and Afrikaans to, to African languages as well. And I found this beautiful collection in the Namibian archives with uh, Tutsi journals, where people, where, where African peoples were um, always describing how Tutsi was relevant for their, their home country. I focused on Ghana and Tanzania as case studies because of their strategic locations. Um, Ghana is located in, in West Africa um, and uh, Tanzania located in Eastern Africa. And both countries played an uh, important regional role but were also strategic locations for the liberation of Southern Africa. And we have to remind ourselves that in the 1960s and 70s, most of Africa was liberated from colonialism, um, except for Southern Africa. And Ghana, for example, with the Bureau of African Affairs and Tanzania with the Liberation Committee had institutions in their capitals that were explicitly organized to host these liberation movements, to train them, to give them political support. So basically, Ghana and Tanzania were, could be showcases of North Korean development aid. And this is why the DPRK invested heavily in these countries, uh, because they realized that most of the African continent would be viewing those places as as the way to go forward. I will skip many of the details of the actual um, development aid projects that were undertaken um, because of a lack of time, but I'm happy to refer you to, to my paper, which includes these details in, for instance, the Ghana Tutsi Farm or the uh, Cholima Agricultural Science Institute in Tanzania. And these were initiatives where uh, North Korean advisors were working sometimes for years uh, on end, and they were active in, 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 in various fields. And you can think of vegetable farms, rice fields, uh, maize production, irrigation, um, all sorts of development aid as, as, as we know it. Ghana and Tanzania are of course examples. Um, Based on my archival research, I assess that at least 20 countries in Africa were receiving North Korean aid. 
and is really commenced after uh, 1981. But as the title of my presentation already uh, gives away, it was largely a failure. And I've listed a number of key characteristics of this North Korean development aid. Um, the first thing that really uh, becomes clear is that North Korea pushed aid on their African allies, even if they, if they didn't want to, uh, if they were reluctant because of all sorts of reasons, North Korea kept on, kept on pushing until they gave in. And the decision to, um, to implement North Korean aid was almost always taken in Pyongyang at high level uh, meetings. And it was always a speed decision. So there was little time for, for preparation and there was no consultation often with, with local staff in, in the areas that were being helped. But even so, um, most of the costs were, um, were paid by the host countries. For example, the, um, the travel of the North Korean advisors, the salaries, uh, transport costs, and all that sort of stuff. What becomes evident from the case studies is that there, is, there, is, uh, there are la language barriers and technical problems, uh, a lack of trust also between local peasants and the North Korean advisors. And ultimately, this leads to, to low yields and projects that are simply uh, not successful. So this is why I think that development aid of North Korea is, is a very interesting prospect. It was a very interesting part of its foreign policy, but one that they probably don't want to remember um, that well. Um, so, what we can say in conclusion is probably that, that the failure of the aid projects is perhaps also a failure of the global appeal of Tuche. And I think this is a result of Tuche as a very vague um, ideology. It's, it's a one size fits all ideology that doesn't uh, take into account the local circumstances of these post independent countries in Africa. The, the efforts of North Korea were ultimately futile because in the 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the crisis in North Korea itself put a hard stop to this kind of activity. So it really was an end of an era in, in that respect. And I don't think that today there are similar uh, projects of North Korea in the developing world. But nonetheless, it's a reminder of uh, a time where the DPRK was trying to lead the way and trying to do it in its own way. Um, but like I said, it ultimately uh, wasn't successful. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. That, I, I really uh, recommend that all the participants, when they have an opportunity, read your paper on this. And I'm sorry our time was so short that we couldn't get into more of the details that you unearthed. Uh, our next speaker is Jonathan Corrado. He's the Director of, of Policy at the Korea Society and a non-resident fellow at the Pacific Forum. Now, he's in New York, but I suspect he'd rather be in Hawaii at the Pacific Forum. But um, anyway, he's going to talk on foreign media uh, and the attitudes toward economic policy among the North Korean general population. It's a topic that's very difficult to get at. Um, and I, I really, uh, again, I, I commend Jonathan for uh, mining the data sources uh, very extensively. Jonathan? Thank you very much, Bill. I'll just share my screen here. So thank you very much to GWIX and KDI uh, for this opportunity to present today. Uh, congratulations to my fellow panelists who are, are pushing forward on such creative ideas and approaches to understanding the materials. Uh, Tycho, thanks for defining Juche so that I don't have to. Uh, that's a minefield that I'd rather not get into. So the main question that I will try to address today is what is the relationship between the availability of foreign media in North Korea and attitudes towards the leadership's economic management. Okay, so uh, this paper derives most of its findings from a handful of refugee surveys, including two by Seoul National University and one by Unification Media Group. 
these are the most up-to-date, relevant, and reliable sources that I could find on the topic. However, they come with a few caveats. Um, the sample size for the SNU survey was about 109, and the UMG survey was about 200. The demographics are skewed towards the normal biases, predominantly from the border regions and predominantly female. The survey respondents all departed North Korea before the COVID pandemic. So although these findings suggest trends that we could use to sort of forecast into the COVID era, uh, the responses should not be seen as reactions to that new pandemic reality, where, which is from all uh, outward appearances, a very seismic shift. So we'll keep a close eye on, on next year's data to see if we could see those kind of reactions. So my main point is gonna be that North Koreans are indeed frustrated by an ineffective economic management system and consumption of foreign media compounds this sentiment because it showcases alternate economic systems, mostly South Korea's, and therefore confirms already prevalent feelings that North Korea's economic system is ineffective and unfair. However, and here's the, the sort of surprising finding uh, that the data showed me. The government has effectively blocked access to critical foreign information and increased the quality of its own media offerings, preserving some amount of pride in North Korea's leader, system, and media, principally among the younger generation. And we'll get into this in a very granular level, the ways in which the younger generation is uh, more loyal. So first, uh, not new to anybody watching this today, uh, but some relevant economic background. Uh, so North Korea, of course, faces profound economic challenges. Uh, trade with China dropped 82% so far in 2021, and the economy tr contracted 4.5% in 2020. Uh, over 45% of the population is undernourished. At the same time, North Koreans are more reliant now on the unofficial economy than they have been for decades. Over 90% of respondents indicated that they participated in the market economy, while participation in the official economy is declining. Only 72% said they participate in the official economy, the lowest level since Kim took power. So North Koreans make very little from their state official jobs. Only 12.8% of the respondents uh, said that they earned more than 5,000 North Korean won per month in 2020 from their official state jobs. Uh, that's not even enough to buy a single kilogram of rice at today's rates. Uh, meanwhile, well over half earned nothing. This means that most households remain reliant on unofficial income for the most basic of provisions. Unfortunately, and now looking uh, at the graph to the right, although North Koreans are now more reliant on the markets, they are earning less there. 34% said they receive less than 10,000 won per month, barely enough to buy two kilograms of rice. The upper income bracket also shrunk in 2020 to the lowest level seen since 2012. The situation has probably become even graver post COVID with trade at an all time low, internal movement restricted, and market time restricted. Uh, so, understanding that foreign information undermines ideological and behavioral conformity of the population, the, the authorities have spared no expense on a battle for hearts and minds, pursuing both offensive and defensive tactics. For example, Kim has empowered crackdown squads with advanced tech and created a new anti-reactionary thought law to increase penalties on those caught consuming foreign media. The government has also tried to compete against foreign content by upping the quality of its own offerings, and this is having some positive effect. In addition to propaganda, other potent indoctrination tools are worth mention. Uh, things like ideological education, which starts at the elementary level and goes all the way up. Uh, weekly lectures, weekly self-criticism sections, uh, all of which provide added opportunity for the government to monopolize the inputs that comprise the North Korean worldview. So recently there's been uh, a lot of attention paid to the ideological purity of the youth Kim called for youth league organizations to wage, quote, an uncompromising struggle against the capitalist ideology, which runs counter to socialism, end quote. And in April, Kim instructed party cells to, quote, take care of young people's attire, hairstyles, speech, and behaviors, and always educate and control them so that they may pursue an honest and lofty way in their economic and moral life, end quote. This sustained high-level attention from Kim Jong-un is unusual and indicative of the leader's priorities. While these cultural expressions might sound frivolous, Kim's government believes the problem they pose is systemic because they represent a deeper well of social change that corrodes socialist culture and undermines its rule. 
The economy is a soft spot ideologically because the government's failings are so apparent there. The youth represents the future of Kim's rule. This explains why he wants to get ahead of the problem and has focused so much energy and attention there. So let's review the state of play, uh, what's going on in terms of uh, foreign media getting into the country. Over 70% of respondents said that accessing foreign information has become more dangerous since Kim Jong-un came to power. And as the years have gone on, it's just become more and more difficult. Consequently, fewer people are consuming it and less often. In 2020, the proportion of respondents who never access South Korean media jumped from 8.6% to 17.4%. That's the top graph there, the yellow uh, bars. And those who watched it often or sometimes both dropped as well. In 2021, it's most likely that the situation got worse. When it comes to learning about the outside world, people continue to prize word of mouth over foreign sources of information. Reliance on foreign media is lower in the last few years compared to 2015 to 2017. You can look at that uh, lower graph for that information. And the quality of the word of mouth news will have been negatively impacted by the border closure, foreign media drop, and internal movement restrictions, all ways that uh, people find out about the outside world outside of the North Korean government sources. When the UMG survey asked, oh, okay, so what kind of impact uh, is this having? When the UMG survey asked what foreign information North Korean people need the most, 41.5% said news about South Korean society, 18% said South Korean entertainment, and 14.5% said news about North Korean society. This response illustrates that North Koreans think, what North Koreans think that the North Korean media is deficient in covering and underscores the high level of curiosity in South Korea. So that's the graph to the right. Now moving on to the graph to the left. Uh, evaluations of state media actually improved in 2020. That's the blue line going up and the red line going down uh, with a sharp drop of skepticism. The percentage of respondents who think North Korean media is mostly true or partially true increased 10%. And the portion of skeptics dropped 16%. These two trends suggest that most people give the benefit of the doubt to the government broadcasters. Two reasons explain this trend. First, the quality, content, and reliability of North Korean media has been improved in recent years. They've been covering things like floods in a very timely manner, for instance. Um, second, a decline in the availability of foreign media deprives the people of resources needed to dispute and disconfirm the narratives presented in state propaganda, thereby making it look more credible, even though it, it might not be. Okay, so what happens after uh, North Korean people view uh, foreign media? Well, a big impact is the way they view the South. So watching foreign media has an impact on the way North Korean people think and behave. The percentage of respondents who said that their impression of South Korea improved a lot increased from 59% in 2018 to 73% in 2020. So people are, more people are feeling positive about the South when viewing this, uh, this media. When asked what changes occur after watching South Korean media, the top answer was increased curiosity about the South, followed by started singing and started singing South Korean songs and decided to seek out more South Korean media. So it's not just having an ideological impact, it's having a, an actual behavioral impact. So although the foreign content that North Koreans consume may not be focused on economic issues, it can nonetheless have a big impact on the way that they view the economy. To make this point, I'll quote a few refugees. A former wholesale trader in her late 30s said, people are very interested in North Korean media. The music is all about loyalty. People are not very interested in North Korean media. The music is all about loyalty. Before I watched South Korean dramas, I had no idea that South Korea was developed to this extent. When drinking with friends, sometimes we imitate the South Korean accent, but we can't use it in public, end quote. Next, a former soldier in his late 20s said, and this is the quote that you see on the screen, our senses become dulled by the daily lectures and ideological education we receive. But when young people watch South Korean dramas, I think it's easy to change their minds. If there's a realistic depiction of people earning according to how much they work, people will start to ask, why are we struggling so much? They'll realize the government is wrong. These quotes demonstrate that foreign media doesn't produce a sudden epiphany, but rather it confirms existing suspicions. And even if it isn't about the economy per se, it could provide evidence for the existence of a different and better economic system. The people in Chairman Kim Jong-un see the economy quite differently. 
Kim blamed the economy shortcomings on sanctions, natural disasters, and faulty planning in this year's Party Congress speech that, in that order. Um, the people evidently disagree. When they're asked, the top three reasons they point to are excessive military expenditures, the absence of reform and opening, and Kim Jong-un himself. Uh, an interesting side note here is that even though they blame excessive military expenditures, they nonetheless, the majority of people support uh, the country's nuclear program. So just an interesting point of tension. Overall, North Koreans are extremely pragmatic about economic matters and evaluate their country's system poorly when it comes to the economy. Kim Jong-un's overall rating dropped and pride in Juche thought decreased for the second year in a row. Support for capitalism remained high, about 68%, while support for socialism remained low. So now a, a surprising um, finding. So we're all used to headlines like these, uh, but the survey data provides a major complication. Although North Koreans in general have more negative assessments of the economy, uh, when we parse these questions by age group, the picture becomes a bit more complicated. That's because far from being the reactionary and anti-socialist Jongmadong generation that North Korean media frequently frets about, the younger cohort are actually consistently more positive when it comes to rating Kim Jong-un and the economy. However, I think there is a Jongmadong generation, and that is the cohort that is currently in their 40s. This group came of age during the arduous march, a traumatic experience in which the social contract broke down completely, stamping their entire worldview. As we'll see, this cohort, the people in their 40s, is consistently the most negative in assessments about the government and economic management. This is something that the authors of the SNU survey point out. So North Korean pride in, state, in the state ideology of Juche, which Tycho uh, kindly defined for me, has dropped dramatically, hitting a five-year low. From 2019 to 2020, those with a lot or some pride in Juche dropped from 61 to 54 percent, lowest number recorded since 2015. However, the, the younger respondents exhibited more pride than the older ones. Over 60% of 20 and 30 year olds had at least some pride in Juche, while over 64% of 40 year olds had no or not much pride. When asked about their preference between socialism and capitalism, all age groups indicated at least 50% support for capitalism, demonstrating a cross-cutting recognition of the faults of the current socialist system. Once again, young respondents were more likely to support socialism and the other groups were relatively more critical. It's the graph on the right. Kim Jong-un's approval rating dropped by a significant margin in 2020. Approximately 62% of respondents in 2020 said that Kim Jong-un had an approval rating of over 50%, down over 10 percentage points over two years. Once again, the younger respondents held more favorable views, as you can see on the graph on the left. SNU uh, the SNU survey asked respondents about the extent of criticism towards the government and the leader. Criticism edged up slightly in 2020, with 52.3% of respondents seeing some. The younger cohort perceived less criticism than the older one, as shown by the graph on the right. So when we break down by uh, job, there are some other interesting findings. So respondents with experience in the market tended to see more critical behavior. Foreign currency earners perceive the highest amount of government criticism, followed by office workers and market traders. Soldiers and farmers saw the lowest amount. This finding is consistent with prior research. A 2017 CSIS survey found that North Koreans expressed the most animosity when the government undercuts their entrepreneurial activities. Uh, of course, it would have been great for me in this presentation if they had parsed this data by uh, exposure to foreign media, but unfortunately that was not available. Okay, so let's step back and sort of review the, the major trends here. The reduced of foreign media has reduced the critical capacity of North Koreans to dispute narratives conveyed through state media, lectures, and education. At the same time, the government has increased the quality of its own media offerings. Both of these factors explain why the credibility of state media got a boost in 2020, although I think there's more research uh, needed in order to parse these, uh, tease these two factors out from one another. The younger cohort is especially vulnerable to this effect, leading North Koreans to have more positive assessments of the North Korean government, leader, and system. This tendency could be explained by a confluence of factors, effective state indoctrination, decreased access to foreign media, lack of a traumatic experience leading to a more pessimistic assessment like the arduous March generation in the 40s, and lack of experience in the markets where people encounter a more adversarial relationship with the government. 
It's possible that all these explanations apply. None of these factors are mutually exclusive, but I suspect that some might be more salient. This leads me to my final slide. Since these findings come from refugees who left North Korea before coronavirus impacted the country, we must wait until next year's survey to find out just how dramatic the changes have been. It's likely that access to foreign information has further diminished. How has this affected views on the economy and the credibility of state media? It's possible that the coronavirus pandemic could become a new traumatic event that significantly impacts the way that the younger population views the government, just like the Arduous March did for the prior generation. Even without foreign media, this could cause the younger population to reverse its tendency to view the government with rose-colored glasses and instead join the older generations in a chorus of criticism. Although it is apparent that multiple factors lead to the population to feel and express frustration about the government's economic management, there's compelling evidence that foreign media plays a strong role. Foreign media, especially South Korean content, helps Koreans gain a comparative lens, a discerning viewpoint, and a sense of kinship with the South. It showcases a powerful alternate reality that implicitly suggests the inequities of their own economic system. It provides them with a measuring stick and a window to the wider world, equipping them to, with knowledge and information that helps them to understand their world and their place in it. That's it for me, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Again, uh, I really commend the way you were able to exploit those surveys. Um, and I, I actually have some questions I want to raise once we get to the discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Meredith Shaw. She's associate professor at the University of Tokyo, and she's going to discuss global finance through the lens of North Korea's state propaganda, which again, very challenging kind of topic. Uh, please, Meredith. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? I'm going to share my screen as well. Uh, there we go. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, the study I'm going to talk about today begins from an observation that I made in the process of reading uh, historical novels produced by the North Korean Workers Party. While the overwhelming majority of these novels focus on domestic settings, I started noticing that certain very high profile novels, particularly those published since the 2000s, occasionally veer into foreign settings and characters. And these chapters provide a fairly lengthy and surprisingly accurate descriptions of certain events, uh, relatively accurate. Um, they seem to be almost teaching uh, uh, more, far more than is required to move the plot along. Uh, things like, you know, what is the IMF and what is the uh, what is the World Bank? Um, so this led me to wonder if these novels might be performing some sort of pedagogical role in addition to, of course, indoctrination. Um, and this observation that I came to inductively led me to a more deductive hypothesis that uh, perhaps North Korea, because of the nature of the globalized world and its own economic needs, has been forced to accept that some subset of its elite members must have some practical knowledge of certain economic and political topics like the workings of global finance. This put it in an awkward position as uh, Jonathan just described to us. We know that it uh, does a very good job and, and uh, uh, of controlling information about the outside world and it seems like it's doing so more effectively than ever. Um, just can't let its people go online and read The Economist, even, even if, they're, um, if they need to do it for their job. Um, so assuming this, the question is, how does such an isolated regime manage those elites who have to interact with finance and the outside world? In a world where private banking doesn't really happen and nobody has a mortgage or a 401k, how do they understand things like bankruptcy and subprime loans? Uh, these, there are North Korean economic texts, of course, but these tend to be very dry and abstract and they don't really cover current events or put issues into a context the way that narrative fiction can. So here I'm mainly looking at certain high profile novels produced by the party that provide dramatized accounts of recent history. 
Uh, I talk about these books more in my paper and defend my assertion that these are mainly read by and intended for elites uh, and that uh, the party has ways of making them almost like assigned reading for uh, ideological uh, discussions, at least according to uh, the latest information I have, which admittedly is about 10 years old. Um, when I say economic elites, here I'm talking about anyone who works in an economic field, uh, deals with trying to earn foreign currency or trade, um, possibly the uh, Tonju class that we talked about yesterday a little bit, um, maybe needs this information. Uh, we know that um, uh, some elites are sent to Europe for information, for education, but this is a tiny percentage and uh, only for a limited time. So the high profile, the high profile novels may serve as a supplement to update their basic knowledge. Um, here I have some brief descriptions of a few of the American characters that I've met through these novels who seem to play this expository role. Um, there's a sort of a pattern here of uh, one younger kind of very bright and hopeful American junior official and his senior, very cynical mentor. Uh, some of these biographical details seem to be a composite of actual people. And so I have a lot of fun guessing who they might be. I think I have a pretty good idea of who Conan Jr. might be, but uh, I, I won't reveal that. Um, anyway, so uh, it's important to note here that most party literature is very reluctant to feature foreign characters or settings at all, even in a negative light. The vast majority of novels stay inside North Korea and focus on what the leaders are doing inside the country. Until the 90s, there were almost no depictions of foreign characters at all. And I think this started to change with uh, the Carter summit in 1994. Uh, some novels started telling this story from Jimmy and Rosalind Carter's perspectives. Uh, since then, there have been several novels featuring American characters who get significant character development with sometimes entire chapters told from their point of view as a way of showing what's happening from the American side. And um, these characters are still not really common, but I argue that their rareness is a clue that the fact that propaganda is willing to give space to these foreign characters, even though uh, the party clearly prefers not to, indicates how important this subject matter must be. So these characters basically serve as conduits for conveying information to the reader via their dialogue and internal thoughts in the novel. In the interest of time, I'm just going to show you a few of my favorite excerpts here. You can read my paper for more details. So um, for example, here's uh, the character Conan Jr. He's having some, just sort of his internal monologue remembering how the 2008 financial crisis started. Um, he says it was caused by real estate conglomerates chasing huge profits from skyrocketing housing prices and the lower class people who got tied up in speculation by taking out loans. Um, so, you know, here the novel is basically describing subprime housing loans. Um, this is then connected to the uh, later developments, the bankruptcies of Lehman Brothers and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And it, uh, the text also sort of explains what those are. And from there to a discussion of how this affected global capital flows and confidence in the dollar, global wealth measured in goods and services versus securities and bonds, which uh, they call here fake money. Um, this goes, for, goes on for several pages like this. Uh, this. Basically, the plot comes to a standstill and you get this mini lecture about global finance. Uh, most of it is uh, obviously very selective, but pretty accurate for what it is. Of course, this topic is uh, what probably the lowest hanging fruit for the party. Uh, it's a great story for them. It's, it's your greedy capitalist preying on the poor and destroying the world. So it makes sense that they would be comfortable writing extensively about it. 
but the level of detail and the use of these foreign characters perspective to tell a story is still unusual. Another fo big focus of um, a lot of North Korean media, Rodong Shinmun, uh, has always been the idea of dollar dumping uh, and how the dollar is going to collapse soon and destroy uh, American hegemony in the world. Uh, again, the novels seem to work as a supplement to this, this reporting, this theme, and they add a little more detail and context for North Korean readers. So there's a long section here where Conan's mentor, Milton, frets about the future of the dollar. And uh, he's, he's talking about how China holds all of these US currency reserves. And if China were to decide to sell off all of its bonds and convert its dollars to euros, the US will collapse and uh, there, or else there'll be a war uh, with China and the US. And um, in the process, Milton kind of also references a couple of old conspiracy theories about uh, Saddam Hussein was gonna dump the dollar and that's how the Iraq war started. And um, the, AD, the AMF was all about um, trying to create a central bank over all of Asia. And I found that these are actually conspiracy theories on the internet that have been circulating at various times. So the author seems to be um, kind of mining the corners of the internet here, but the main point is to underscore how the dollar ensures US supremacy and how the whole system got set up in the first place and what might disrupt it. Um, the uh, Asian financial uh, the Asian financial crisis of 1997 doesn't seem to be covered in nearly as much detail as the uh, 2008 financial crisis. But I think this is um, more of an indication of how party literature has evolved to show more foreign characters in the decade in between. But I did find some references in this novel that came out in 2003. Um, this character, Rilsey, is interesting because he's a very high level Clinton aide but he's also facing personal bankruptcy in the novel. And so that makes for a lot of very bitter and passionate speeches about the state of global finance from his perspective. And these speeches also serve as mini lectures about uh, things like neoliberalism and market competition and other things that the more straight laced and ideologically pure North Korean characters can't really talk about. So he, he has a very interesting role in that novel, in addition to um, <laughs> having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> um, so far, uh, I've discussed the more current events focused novels, but in fact, the majority of novels produced even today focus on North Korea's glory days and the war and uh, liberation, the, the uh, period of resistance against Japan. Uh, but I found that even those can offer important present day implications if you read them closely. The novel Age of Prosperity, which was published in 2009, at first glance appears to be a typical history, a, a historical dramatization of the country's economic construction post liberalization. Post uh, liberalize, liberation. Um, those of you who attended yesterday's lecture um, will recall Junie Lee's discussion of the 1947 currency reform and the various problems in its aftermath. I was really glad to uh, hear him discuss that because it dovetails really nicely with this novel that I discuss in my paper, uh, which dramatizes those same events. And the novel obviously depicts the reform in a much more positive light, but it also gives uh, a level of detail on the economic disruptions that were occurring at the time uh, in the late 1940s uh, as a way to give dramatic context to the reform. Uh, for instance, the excerpt here describes how there were these uh, reactionary users who were um, basically coming in from the South and uh, bringing all sorts of Chosun banknotes, which were circulating throughout the whole peninsula, and uh, I was disrupting everything. Uh, and so North Korea couldn't stabilize prices, and that they had to like get 
uh, control of the situation. So this gets across the idea that uh, circulation of different banknotes from the South and the Soviets were making it impossible to uh, move forward economically. And the novel suggests that this was part of a deliberate South Korean strategy um, to destabilize the North. So there's, there's a good scene where a stranger shows up at the market with stacks of freshly printed banknotes and tries to buy up all the rice. And uh, it turns out he's from the South. And so Kim Il-sung's wife witnesses this and she tells her husband about it. And that's what makes him start planning the currency reform. But um, beyond the novel's contents, we have to consider the timing, of course, of when it was published, October 2009. Uh, this is just two months before the infamous 2009 currency reform. Uh, most of you will remember how devastating this reform was uh, to the, the burgeoning uh, market entrepreneur class, uh, wiped out their savings overnight. Um, given that context, it cannot be a coincidence that a major historical novel was published by the party just months before that happened to give a detailed amount, detailed account of a very similar reform with a very similar justification. And the way the reform gets revealed in the novel is also intriguing. Uh, one of the main characters is a history, is an economics professor, and he is tasked by the party with delivering a lecture on the topic of historical currency problems in dynastic Korea. And everyone thinks that this is uh, bizarre arcane topic and they wonder why the, the party ordered all of its propaganda workers to attend this lecture. But then the professor is summoned to a high uh, top secret late night meeting with Kim Il-sung. And uh, at that meeting, the leader reveals his true intentions of a currency reform. Here he's, uh, this quote uh, where Kim Il-sung is, is telling the room that there's gonna be a currency reform and he says, uh, we couldn't advertise it formally because it was a secret, but your lecture did an eloquent job of promoting it. So here we can see a lot of similarities with the 2009 reform. Is that absolute secrecy, the surprise announcement, uh, the limit on how much money can be exchanged, the belief that it will artificially drop prices, and uh, the idea that outside saboteurs are trying to use currency to disrupt the economy. The timing of publication suggests that the novel was intended mainly to advertise the party's justification for the new currency reform and put it in historical context. But there's also something very meta going on here. Just as the seemingly irrelevant history lecture foretold the 1947 currency reform in the novel, the novel, the novel itself seems to foretell the 2009 currency reform that would follow a few months after its publication. I can only speculate, but perhaps this novel itself may have been intended as a sort of clue to reward attentive cadres who dutifully do their party assigned reading. At any rate, anyone with foreknowledge of the reform would have had a significant financial advantage. So in conclusion, I would just like to say that this is ongoing research and I realize a lot of questions are probably left unanswered here about the intended purpose and uh, how influential these novels are. Uh, so I welcome your comments and suggestions for where to go from here and particularly any suggestions for other sources that I could incorporate. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Meredith. I, I confess that's, I would never have thought about approaching the topic through the novels. And it makes just a tremendous uh, contribution to the way we can look at things that are going on in North Korea. Um, I know that there's been some work looking at, at films. Uh, so just to go into the literature uh, and not into just the, the dry economic journals, but to, but to go into something that's more popularized uh, again, very creative and quite useful, and particularly on the topic of the currency reform. Uh, and that also, as you've noted, integrated very well with what was discussed yesterday. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first discussant. Um, it will be Benjamin Young. He's an assistant professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University, and he's going to uh, discuss the 
uh, paper on African aid, but I encourage all the discussants uh, to make remarks on the other presentations if they have something that they would like to say at this time. Following the uh, discussions, uh, I'll give the uh, presenters an opportunity, uh, a brief opportunity to respond to any points that they choose to. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Bill. Um, it, first of all, it's an, it was, it's an honor to be here today and be a discussant for uh, Taicho Vanderhoek's very promising paper on North Korea's development aid in Africa. Um, I think in many ways, all these papers kind of look at North Korea's uh, focus on foreign uh, currents, foreign trends, and so kind of defeats the notion of North Korea as a uh, hermetic kingdom. Um, I was previously familiar with Taicho's work, and I think his research on North Korea Africa ties is very intriguing, as he's one of the few, if only, scholars to analyze these relations using African, British, and South Korean archival documents. Uh, African archives are especially difficult to access, and many governments there do not have the same archival transparency processes as Western country. Nevertheless, Taicho was able to use Namibian repositories for his research, and I'm excited to see if there are other African countries' archives he may explore in the future. Uh, Taicho also conducted an interview with an anonymous former North Korean diplomat, which is both fascinating and intriguing. Uh, and Taicho's previous research on North Korean monuments and laborers in Africa are some of the works that I've cited in, in my own publications. His research is enterprising and innovative, and this paper is a continuation of this trend. First, I want to point out some of the strengths of Taijo's paper, uh, his ability to intertwine both, North, both African and North Korean history deserves praise. These two disparate historiographies are sometimes hard to put into a cohesive narrative, but I think Taicho does a good job here. I think the two case studies of Tanzania and Ghana are a useful way to think about North Korea Africa ties. Uh, nonetheless, perhaps a bit more context in North Korea's foreign policy could be added. For example, how much is North Korea's Africa policy a continuation of Soviet or Chinese grand strategy? The Cubans are also very active in Africa during the Cold War. So comparing these two small socialist states' African policies could be interesting. Both are small post-colonial nations that came out of guerrilla movements and operated in an anti-colonial third worldist order. Uh, I also think there's room to grow in the paper. It's only about 12 pages, so additional historical context could be helpful if Taicho was to further develop this paper into a full-length journal article. Uh, sometimes the article gets lost in some of the minutia of agricultural products and bilateral agreements. Uh, so in other words, I think Taicho could benefit by taking a step back and, taking a, and looking at the larger picture of DPRK Africa ties. I also think Taicho does a good job of bringing in British archival materials. The National Archives of the UK are, in my opinion, some of the best archives in the world. They have a huge variety of materials related to the two Koreas that are largely forgotten by historians. In addition, the South Korean diplomatic archives, which Taicho uses, are a great addition to this work. Nonetheless, I found some of Taicho's secondary sources a bit befuddling. Uh, for example, on page four, he references uh, B.R. Meyer's work, book, The Cleanest Race, for a sentence that states, quote, uh, the focus of DPRK literature was, of course, Juche, its own ideology of self-reliance. Uh, but this citation is strange since uh, Myers very clearly argues that, North, that Juche is not North Korea's guiding ideology. According to Myers, North Korea's true ideology is race-based paranoid nationalism. Um, I also think my own uh, book that was published in April of this year um, on North Korea third world ties could be helpful to Chai Cho as well. And uh, the works by Bilal Shalantai and Andre Lankov, um, they're not referenced in the bi bibliography, and I think these uh, secondary sources could also help Tai Cho. Um, but I think the largest issue uh, is with Tai Cho's framing of North Korean development aid in Africa as a failure. I've struggled with the same conceptual framework in my own research on North Korea third world ties. To us, it seems like North Koreans continuously commit own goals and make mistakes in terms of their outreach to African countries. But, to, but compared to Soviet, Chinese, and even Western development aid to Africa, could any of this assistance to Africa really be framed as a success? 
Despite decade, decades of economic existence and humanitarian aid, many countries in Africa are still afflicted by uh, corruption, economic stagnation, and environmental issues. The legacy of colonialism has also left Africa in a considerably disadvantaged position via the global north. And it's not as if some North Korean assistance would have solved these longstanding structural issues. So I think the arg article needs to be reframed a bit in terms of its overall argument. Um, and uh, I think one of the ways in which Taicho could do that is he could center his argument around Juche. Uh, he argues that, quote, Juche was the alpha and omega of North Korean aid. But what does Juche agriculture look like on the ground beyond North Korea's borders? According to scholars like Bruce Cummings, Juche was something quintessentially Korean. So was Juche agriculture in Africa therefore a fruitless project from its inception? Or did Juche simply mean self-reliance, which is something that all post-colonial states could support as an ideal? I think a deeper investigation into what global Juche really means could be useful here for Chai Cho. Um, and it's also, I think it's important to put North Korea's development aid in Africa within the context of socialist internationalism. Communist bloc countries all pitched in to help developing countries in the global south. So even Soviet satellites like East Germany, Hungary, and Bulgaria operated development projects in the third world. Cross-cultural uh, misunderstandings, translation uh, issues, and failed crop yields were just par for the course in this failed revolutionary project known as the International Proletarian Movement. So I don't think North Korea's development aid to Africa was as much of a failure as, as it was one part of a much larger failed global communist movement that promoted the ideals of socialist internationalism, anti-capitalism, and anti-colonial solidarity. At the end of the day, the own internal contradictions of global communism resulted in these failures of helping third world development. Overall, this is a really interesting paper uh, that has great potential, and I hope Taicho continues his innovative work on North Korea-Africa relations. Thank you again for allowing me this opportunity. Bill, Bill, I think you're muted. You're still muted, Bill. There, okay? Yeah. I, I wanna commend you for covering a lot of ground in a very concise way. Uh, and I thought those were pretty helpful suggestions. The next discussant is Jean Lee. Um, and she's going to be talking uh, about uh, Jonathan Corrado's paper. Jean is a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Institute, uh, International Center for Scholars. Uh, and Jean has uh, the unique experience of running the AP Bureau in Pyongyang, um, which uh, gives rise to lots of stories best told over drinks. Jean? Thank you. I, I do want to thank our hosts and all the speakers for what has been really a fascinating two days uh, of um, truly interesting research. So Bill, you know, as you mentioned, this is a tough subject to tackle. So I want to congratulate Jonathan on what really was a rich and insightful paper that I hope is just the start of this vein of research. Uh, this topic, I mean, maybe, you know, it is one that is very dear to my heart, but it is always relevant uh, to look at the regime's use of access to try to control its population. I think it always bears close examination. And I want to say that I think that this paper is particularly relevant to what we're seeing in North Korea at this point, when access and the flow of information, uh, they're both so, so tightly controlled, perhaps more tightly controlled than any other time in recent memory due to those border closures since January 2020. So, you know, Jonathan, I'm happy to see you take a critical and analytical look at what that control over the flow of information means, uh, both for the attitudes that uh, North Koreans bear toward the regime and the policies. And, and you didn't get into this too much in your presentation today, but you do mention this quite a bit in your paper, the regime's ability to control the narrative and you know, I I um I did write a blog post last year uh, questioning the official narrative for why North Korea was sealing its borders, because frankly, I had been seeing North Korea turn inward since the breakdown in nuclear uh, breakdown of those nuclear talks with then President Trump 
in, in Hanoi that Stephen Began mentioned. And I did suspect that the pandemic provided an opportunity, not only to prevent an epidemic that the North Koreans knew that they wouldn't be able to handle. So that's legitimate but also to use it as a chance to regain control over the narrative by stopping the flow of information. Uh, because people are the conveyors. They are in a sense, the mules who carry information back and forth. Uh, but you know, to be honest, my, my suspicion and my feeling was based primarily on personal experience from, from spending time inside North Korea. And it's hard to get, it's hard, to get hard data to, to really back up uh, this suspicion. So I applaud your use of surveys as, uh, as well as your use of economic data to try to make this correlation between economic hardship and perhaps frustration among uh, the North Korean population. Uh, I, I also think that um, I've been concerned about the impact of the loss of access uh, to our ability to really accurately assess what's happening inside North Korea. And this is something that I, I thank you for broaching in your paper. Um, as a journalist who started out, like everyone else, covering North Korea from the outside, I can tell you that spending time inside, as Bill mentions, is it's very different. It changes your perspective. It certainly turns your understanding from black and white to something that might be more technicolor, uh, but also more complicated. And I have seen a kind of acceptance of the official narrative coming from North Korea uh, now among not only government officials in various capitals, but also among journalists. And I find this a bit dismaying, but understandable given our reliance on state media and North Korean propaganda. So I think your critical look at this is, is, is very astute and bears mention. Um, that, is said, I, that is said, I think the focus on how uh, all of this impacts and shapes how North Koreans view their own government or their party's policies, which is really the case, is an interesting thing. And I think that your emphasis on studying how young people in North Korea are getting information, how they feel about Kim Jong-un, how they feel about party policy is such a rich source of information and a rich direction for your research. Uh, I wanted to mention that I do think that uh, there has been on the part of the leadership over the past 12 years, such an emphasis and investment on building loyalty among that generation. That is Kim Jong-un's base. It is his future, his, his future base. And, but as Stephen Began mentioned, there's an inherent, inherent contradiction in this. While Kim Jong-un may want his young people to see their country as modern, he wants them to be sophisticated, he wants them to be educated, there's a risk in giving them exposure to that outside world. And, and I do, uh, get into some of this tension in my own podcast uh, to explain the what was happening in the 2008, 2009, 2010 period when North Korea was trying to send more of its students overseas to try to give them exposure, but the risks that came with that exposure. Um, and again, also how you approach the way that North Koreans view South Korea, you're absolutely right in your paper that North Koreans are bored by their own propaganda, which is why we've seen them shift to a style in their dramas that is similar to South Korean drama. So how were, where were they getting that influence? Obviously from South Korean dramas. Uh, and um, the history is very interesting when you look at how they try to portray South Korea. I've been talking about this a lot in relation to Squid Game, which is a whole other issue, uh, but the North Koreans are increasingly with increasingly with exposure to South Korean dramas, becoming aware that the official portrayal of South Korea as this dreary place where people are just slaves to making money is not quite accurate. Um, I wanted to mention that I think we should note, and you do acknowledge this, that those surveys were very small and understandably representative of the defector community we have in South Korea, if not North Koreans more broadly. Uh, you know that uh, only a fraction of them were members of the Workers' Party, so not part of the main political structure of, of the political elites. So then, of course, we're missing that complete look at how the power base, the, the political elites of Pyongyang, have access to foreign media. And I would be curious, of course, to know how being cut off from foreign media affects their decisions and attitudes. So that's a missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, of course, 
this population is the population that has the potential to effect change. Um, they are the ones who live in the capital and travel, uh, were traveling prior to the border shutdown. They have greater access to foreign media, not only in the course of their education, but from their time living and working abroad, which was until the shutdown, a rite of passage for many politically connected North Koreans. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify and add a little bit of information. You mentioned uh, that it's, apart from a small amount of government approved content, foreign media is banned in North Korea. And I'll just clarify that specifically, it's Western and South Korean content that's restricted. Uh, and, and of course, even then there are exceptions. So Disney cartoons, of course, are allowed. Uh, they're the only Hollywood movies that are allowed. And of course, some North Koreans do have permission to watch Hollywood movies as part of their education. So you'd be surprised how many North Koreans in Pyongyang are familiar with, have watched many more Hollywood movies, frankly, than I have. Um, and I wanted to mention that, of course, that Russian and Chinese content, content from other communist nations and former Eastern Bloc nations, all, that, that content is allowed. Um, one thing I will say that your paper doesn't mention is the impact of foreign journalists in North Korea, because in some ways people like me did provide foreign media content and, and we don't have foreign journalists there right now. So that is another uh, cutoff from access to foreign information. This is certainly a big part of what I did was to make foreign content available. So I want to congratulate you on what I think is the start of a very interesting course of study. Uh, as you, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that credibility rose in 2020 uh, during this period of isolation, which perhaps suggests the success of the control of information in not only shaping the narrative, but influencing how people see the narrative. Um, but I think as you mentioned, the, the challenge really lies in um, how we're going to understand this in the years ahead. I don't know that we're going to be able to see and assess how attitudes may have shifted during the pandemic, because by the time we get a clear read, by the time we have access, I think the narrative will have shifted again, attitudes will have shifted again, because we're going to see a huge push of propaganda from now, we're seeing it now, uh, into 2020, which is going to be a big year for Kim Jong-un. Um, I wanted to, if, if it's okay, I'd also like to comment on Meredith Shaw's uh, presentation, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, as you know, foreign publications are vetted in advance and then made available, including publications about the economy in South Korea, as well as the United States and elsewhere. Um, and I wanted to mention that um, there was a novel about a Korean American journalist that came out during my time working uh, in North Korea, and I was advised to read it. I didn't, don't think that I did my homework properly because I, I did not see anything like that journalist portrayed in that novel, but that is another example of Americans appearing in North Korean literature. And perhaps I was not a good cadre because I didn't fulfill, uh, I did read it eventually, but I didn't fulfill the path that was laid out for me in that book. So I just wanted to mention that. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you to be looking at the literature, which uh, I do think is rich in helping us understand how they're trying to uh, convey a certain message about their policies uh, to a specific population, to their people. Thank do you, you do you remember what the novel was called? <laughs> yes, it's called Nyalgita, so Woman Reporter, and it is something ah. that uh, I do hope to do some more research on. So I hope we can collaborate. I, yeah. I hope we can collaborate on this and share some notes about it. I'm absolutely fascinated by uh, your look at this and think it's we think it's under research. So research. So I applaud that entirely. Thank you. Oh, thank you all very much. Uh, we have a, a final discussant, Dr. Yul Chin Lim. Uh, he's associate professor at uh, Kyung Nam University. And uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there's a globe on the right that says interpretation. He will make his remarks in Korean and simultaneous translation will be available uh, in English. Dr. Lim. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 우리 그 메리티스 쇼 교수님이 아 uh, 정말 훌륭한 그 uh, 논문을 쓰신 것 같아요. 아 uh, 북한의 그 북한에서 발간되는 소설을 통해서 어 uh, 글로벌 금융 위기에 대한 어 uh, 북한 측의 인식을 uh, 아주 흥미롭게 uh, 잘 이렇게 묘사도 하고 또 분석도 한것 같습니다. 
어, 사실 그 어, 북한은 그 종이를 그러니까 페이퍼를 많이 생산할 수 없기 때문에 어, 이 책을 많이 발간하지는 않았습니다. 아, 어, 그러다 보니까 이 북한에서 이 소설 책이 어, 북한 주민들에게 굉장히 인기가 있음에도 불구하고 어, 이게 이 책이 많지가 않은 거예요. 어, 그러다 보니까 아, 어, 소설 책이 나오면 그 소설 책을 여러 사람들이 이렇게 돌려보는 거죠. 어, 우리 자본주의 사회처럼 어, 쉽게 어, 책을 이, 어, 소설 책을 구입하기가 어렵기 때문에 아, 예, 이 좋은 소설책이 나오면 여러 사람들이 이렇게 돌려보는 어, 그런 어떤 그 상황입니다. 어, 제가 지금 들고 있는 그 여러분한테 보여드리는 이 책이 어, 1994년에 나온 소설책입니다. 이게 영생이라고 어, 이터널 라이프라는 이 소설책입니다. 이 소설책은 어, 1994년에 그 한반도 1차 그핵 위기를 어, 소설 형식으로 어, 이렇게 묘사한 그런 책입니다. 이 책인데 여기 내용을 보면 어, 김일성 그 주석과 어, 미국의 지미 카트 대통령 간의 그 대화가 아주 어, 자세하게 기록이 되어 있습니다. 여러분 아시겠지만 어, 1994년 어, 5월 달에 한반도 핵위기가 발생했을 때 어, 한반도의 전쟁을 막기 위해서 어, 지미 카트 어, 전 대통령이 평양을 방문했었는데요. 그 방문했을 때 김일성 주석과 나눈 아주 상세한 내용이 소설이라는 형식으로 어, 기록이 되어 있는 겁니다. 근데 이, 이런 식으로 북한은 어, 이 소설이라는 형식을 통해서 많은 그 역사적인 팩트, 역사적인 사실을 기록해서 어, 북한 내 어, 어, 그 간부들이라든지 당, 당 간부들이라든지 내각 간부들 어, 그리고 또 경제 부분에 일하는 또 어, 일하는 사람들 이런 사람들이 이 책을 이렇게 어, 돌려봅니다. 그러니까 이 소설이 굉장히 중요한 학습 자료이고요, 학습 자료이기도 하고 또. 어, 어떻게 보면 그이 사상을 어, 더욱 이렇게 강화하는 데 필요한 어, 중요한 도구로서 어, 활용되고 있기도 합니다. 그러니까 우리 자본주의 사회에서 어, 일반적으로 어, 이 평가하는 어, 소설하고 어, 북한에서 평가하는 소설은 많이 이제 다르다고 보는 거죠. 그러니까 훨씬 더 어, 이 북한 주민들에게 가치가 있는 어, 그런 중요한 어, 학습 도서이기도 하고 또 사상을 어, 교양하는 그런 어, 도서라는 그런 측면이 있는 것이죠. 어, 이 글로벌 금융위기는 사실 북한에게도 굉장한 충격을 안겨줬습니다. 어, 북한이 국제금융 시스템에 접근을 못하고 있지만 그럼에도 불구하고 북한은 늘 국제금융위기에 대해서 관심을 가지고 있고 또 그러면서 이제 자신들의 어, 어, 전략을 대외적인 전략 또는 경제 정책을 수립하는데 많은 참고를 하고 있는 것이죠. 어, 2007년에 발생했던 그 글로벌 금융 위기는 어, 북한에게 특히 또 관심이 있었던 이유가 여러분 잘 아시지만은 북한은 미국을 늘 인식을 하고 있고 어, 미국의 모든 변화들 모든 변화들이 자신들에게는 굉장히 중요한 의미를 갖는다고 그렇게 이제 생각을 하는 것이죠. 특히 이제 이 글로벌 금융 위기는 어, 북한 그러니까 글로벌 금융 위기는 어, 이 글로벌 질서 어, 질서를 어, 이끌어가는 어, 미국의 위상의 변화하고 연계돼 있기 때문에 어, 북한은 더 관심을 가지고 다양한 방식으로 이 정보를 어, 공유를 어, 내부적으로 어, 이 정보를 공유했던 것으로 이제 그렇게 저는 알고 있고요. 그리고 북한은 제재만큼이나 제재만큼이나 이 금융이라는 거, 이 금융에 관심이 많습니다. 그러니까 북한 입 북한은 인식하기를 제재는 곧 금융 제재. 어? 그러니까 제재 중에서 가장 어, 고통스러워하는 부분이 금융 제재라고 생각을 하고 있거든요. 그런 맥락에서 
이 국제 금융에 대한 어, 관심을 어, 더 많이 이, 보여줘 왔다 이렇게 이제 얘기를 할 수가 있는 겁니다. 어, 그리고 또 어, 북한은 이제 다른 한편으로 국제 금융 국제 금융에 관심을 가졌던 것은 결국은 이제 어, 자신들이 경제 경제 개발을 하기 위해서는 다른 저개발 국가들의 사례처럼 사례가 보여주는 것처럼 결국은 국제 금융 기구로부터 어, 이 자본을 어, 조달받는 것이 굉장히 중요하다는 판단을 했던 거고 또 북한은 단순히 자본을 조달받는 것뿐만이 자본을 조달받는 것도 중요하지만 어, 일종의 그 어, 뭐랄까요 어, 이 경제 개발하는 과정에서 어, 이 금융을 어떻게 활용하는 것이 가장 어, 어, 중요한가 어떻게 어떻게 가장 잘 어, 활용할 수 있을까 이런 부분 이런 부분에 대한 관심이 굉장히 많았습니다. 그래서 실제로 어, 북한의 그 어, 조선중앙은행 관계자들이라든지 또는 북한의 어, 경제 개발과 관련된 그런 기관에 기관에 종사하는 사람들이 국제금융기구 어, 사람들을 굉장히 만나고 싶어했고 만나서 많은 것을 사실은 배우고 싶어했었습니다. 그게 이제 어, 1990년대 어, 어, 후반부터 어, 2000년대 2000년대 후반까지 있었던 현상입니다. 그래서 제가 직접 어, 북한 사람을 안내를 해서 어, 국제금융기구 관계자들을 만나게 이제 주선도 한 그런 어, 저는 경험이 있었습니다. 그래서 이제 어, 이른바 어, 테크니컬 어시스턴스라고 기술 지원이 가능한 그런 조건과 환경을 만들 수 있는 어, 그런 어떤 기회를 주려고 어, 이 국제금융기구와 어, 북한의 어, 경제 관료들을 연결하는 어, 그런 어떤 시도도 했었는데요. 어떻든 어, 북한은 어, 제재 문제와 국제금융 국제금융 문제가 굉장히 밀접하게 연관돼 있기 때문에 특별히 더 관심이 있었다는 부분 그리고 자신의 경제 개발을 하기 위해서는 국제금융 시스템에 접근하는 것이 굉장히 중요하다. 특히 국제금융기구와의 관계가 굉장히 중요하다는 인식을 갖고 있었다. 이런 맥락에서 어, 이 소설이 어, 북한에서 발간한 소설을 통해서 북한이 글로벌 금융위기를 어떻게 인식, 인식을 하고 있고 또 거기에 대해서 어떤 대응을 해왔는지를 연구하는 것은 상당히 중요한 의미가 있다. 이 말씀을 드리고요. 자 시간이 이제 많, 많지 않아서 제가 좀 줄, 어, 가능하면 어, 많이 줄여서 얘기를 하겠습니다. 아, 우리 이제 그, 어, 이 메르더스 쇼 교수님께 이 연구를 좀더 보완 발전시키는 맥락에서 어, 몇 가지 좀 제안을 하고 싶은데요. 어떻든 이 오늘 발표하신 이 논문에서 인용된 어, 북한의 소설은 매우 소수입니다. 아주 그 일부 소설만 어, 어, 인용을 하셨는데 사실 좀더 많은 소설을 이렇게 연구를 하시면 아무래도 좀더 이렇게 어, 북한이 이 글로벌 금융 또는 글, 글로벌 금융 위기 또, 또는 이 글로벌 금융 위기와 어, 제재와의 관계 이런 거에 대한 인식을 하는 데 도움이 될것 같습니다. 좀더 많은 북한 소설을 어, 이렇게 탐구할 필요가 있다는 얘기를 드리고 싶고요. 그리고 저는 저는 이제 북한의 금융과 관련해서 주로 연구하는 그 어, 북한 문헌이 경제 연구지라는 겁니다. 아마 알고 계실 텐데. 북한에서 발간하는 분기별로 이제 1년에 4번 발간하는 이 경제연구지를 꼭 봐야 됩니다. 특히 이 김정은 시대에 들어와서 어, 이 금융, 어, 금융, 뭐 회계, 세무 이런 관련된 어, 이 논문들이 북한 학자들이 쓴 논문들이 굉장히 많아졌거든요. 그런 내용들하고 소설 내용하고 서로 이렇게 비교 분석을 하면 훨씬 풍부한 시사점을 얻을 수 있다고 보는 거고요. 그리고 또, 어, 이 노동신문, 노동신문에서도 사실은, 어, 글로벌 금융위기 뿐만 아니라, 아, 어, 미국을 중심으로 한이 국제금융 질서에 대한 그런 기사들이 많이 나오고 있습니다. 그래서 이런, 어, 노동신문에 나오는 이 기사들도 보다 많이 참조를 해서, 어, 이, 이 연구를 하시면, 어, 보다 또 풍부한 아, 아, 분석거리가 분석하고 평가할 내용들이 있을 거다 이렇게 판단을 합니다. 아, 마지막으로 이제 말씀드리고 싶은 것은 김정은 위원장이 아, 교육을 굉장히 강조하고 있습니다. 아, 교육을 강조하면서 과학기술 관련된 교재 참고서적을 지금 굉장히 많이 지금 아, 발견하고 있는데요. 
그 내용 중에 하나가 또 국제금융과 관련된 그런 내용들입니다. 그러니까 북한 내에 일반 그 학생들이, 북한의 학생들이 활용하는 많은 교재들이 지금 나와 있거든요. 그 중에 국제금융 관련된 교재를 꼭 한번 구해서 보셔야 아, 지금 소설을 통해서 북한의 글로벌 금융 위기에 대한 그런 인식을 좀더 이렇게 풍부하고 정교하게 이해할 수 있을 거라는 그런 말씀을 드립니다. 예, 이상입니다. 감사합니다, Dr. Lim, very much, Dr. Lim, particularly for making the recommendations. Uh, I hope the translation went well for everyone. Uh, we are uh, going to be turning it back to the participants for some remarks, but I'm going to take a moderator's prerogative and make a, a few observations. Uh, first, with regard to the uh, agricultural outreach uh, in Africa, um, a lot of attention was paid to what was going on in the 80s, but internally, North Korea in the early 80s launched what was called nature remaking projects. Uh, a big focus of those was in agriculture, uh, reclaiming land from the sea and uh, plowing up uh, the mountains, deforestation and, and, and plowing the sides of hills, uh, all of which contributed to the disaster of the early 90s and the famine. Uh, so I'm not quite sure uh, that North Korea's reputation in agriculture, which was normally uh, looked upon as doing much better than the other socialist countries, is as deserved uh, as it was thought. Um, in terms of Jonathan, oh, one more thing, yeah. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, when North Korea is doing a lot of this outreach and working with the NAM, uh, if you take a more global look, we have a big competition going on between uh, socialist development uh, paths and capitalist development paths. Um, and economists are looking at uh, the uh, comparison of growth rates between countries operating these different systems. Um, it was a, a battle of uh, ideas. Uh, it was carried on globally. And at the same time, you have uh, Raul Prebish pitching import substitution, which is something North Korea also adopted in the mid 70s, which is a form of self-reliance. So maybe taking a uh, broader view before narrowing in, just to amplify some of the comments that uh, Benjamin made earlier. Uh, in terms of Jonathan's paper, uh, I'm intrigued by the difference between the younger and the, and the older uh, North Koreans. Uh, it implies that the younger have no memory uh, and they may be dismissing the memories that are passed on or the experiences passed on by their elders. This also appears to be sort of an international phenomenon right now uh, where you find a resurgence of sympathy for socialist approaches. Uh, you see it happening in, in South America. Uh, it, it's like uh, the, the abject failure of the socialist system uh, and the reasons for it has not been passed on. And, and so the ideas that are being propel, propelled uh, are finding some root uh, in younger persons. You can see it in US colleges. Uh, so we have this trend going on. And finally, in terms of international uh, finance, Notwithstanding uh, Deputy Secretary Begin's comment about Kim Jong Il asking a, or uh, Kim Jong asking about the, what's the World Bank, I suspect his briefers got an earful following that that he wasn't prepared uh, to know. Uh, but in general, my experience is that those North Koreans dealing with foreign exchange and trade are very sophisticated. Uh, they operate. Well, they've learned how to evade international financial regulations to con you know, continue to pursue the uh, income earning and spending in hard currency. Uh, they have learned to exploit SWIFT. Uh, think about uh, the Bangladesh bank heist. Uh, they've learned how to conduct major insurance fraud 
Uh, so, I mean, to do that, you, you just can't approach it from a position of ignorance. You have to approach it from a position of knowing exactly what is going on and what it takes and how they operate. Um, and just a, a Meredith, uh, you intrigue me by uh, having some models in mind of real persons. I know you don't want to get into it, but I would love to know who your candidates are. Uh, and with that, let me turn it back first. Um, now let's go in the same order that we presented uh, and let's go to Tycho. Thank you very much, Bill, for, uh, for these comments. And also uh, much thanks to Ben. Um, I'm immensely grateful for the groundbreaking work that you have done during your own PhD research um, on which I'm building. Um, you, you said a lot of different things. I want, for the sake of time, just to take out one of them, which is the question, how we must judge uh, Juche as an ideology. And personally, I actually agree with Brian Myers when he describes Juche as a superficial philosophical framework that is used for the export track of Pyongyang's propaganda machine. Um, I think Juche allows DPRK to follow an independent foreign policy uh, separated from the Soviet Union or China. Um, and I think that the development aid is such an interesting case because this is where we can see Juche thought in action, so to say. But it doesn't mean anything really. And then we see that these North Korean advisors are being dumped on, on, on African agricultural projects and they move to between different sites in Ghana, for example, because of failed um, experiments, um, they, they have no really time for preparation. So they probably try to do what they, what they do at home in North Korea, but it doesn't, it doesn't work on, on, on foreign soil in, in the same sense. So the failure of development aid is also in a sense, the failure of, of Juche as this global blueprint for a new world. Uh, but in the end, it doesn't really matter because when the 1990s arrive uh, with the Arduous March, um, uh, all of these activities kind of stop. And that's why I, I want to argue in, in, the, in the conclusion of my paper, when I talk about farms and arms, I, I want to argue that farms, uh, the agricultural output is not very important anymore, but the military cooperation is something that also existed in the 1980s and still continues to, to play a role until today. So that would be more of an area with, with a big relevance to uh, today's uh, developments. I'll, Thank I'll you very much. I, I wish we had more time to pursue this, but you know, we are running into a, our, our deadline. Uh, uh, Jonathan, and Jonathan, I want to call your attention to a uh, comment or a question from Bill Brown in chat. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thank you, Bill, and, and thanks so much to Jean for all of your great suggestions and insights. I, I was uh, uh, excited to see that you would be my discussant and then uh, intimidated because who knows this topic better than you. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree that this is COVID presents an opportunity for the regime, at least on the uh, ideological setting, not, not so much the economic setting. Um, you make a really good point that South Korean products, media products have influenced the way that North Korea uh, ha has tried to innovate to capture more of the domestic market share. That, that's something that I could look into a little bit more. And it replicates something that they've done with uh, the economy, like they can't, uh, they blocked chocolate pies from coming through Kaesong, and then they made chocolate dan uh, which I haven't had, but some of my uh, colleagues at Daily NK got their hands on, and apparently they're, they're terrible, <laughs> they're disgusting, but they, <laughs> have you tried the chocolate dan solgi? No, okay, uh, probably good for your health, not to try. Um, so yeah, and then the elite power base, uh, that would be such a fascinating avenue. I wish I had more data to, to get into that or a way to bite it. The only way I could think of is that Priscilla Moriucci 
at Recorded Future has done some really interesting work on their internet habits of the elites. And maybe I could use that as sort of a way in. And then of course, the presence of foreign journalists, how do they shape the information environment? That's another thing that I should probably look into more. Um, let me get to the question from uh, Bill. How is the foreign media received? Smartphone, paper, video? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, lots of different ways. Uh, and the different ways affect, uh, get to different demographics. So radio broadcasts, uh, shortwave radio, they, they've got uh, a lot of these projects funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. South Korea has its own. The BBC does one, uh, tons of different ones, uh, RFA, VOA. Um, so they broadcast into the country and then uh, the North Koreans have to jerry-rig their radios in order to receive them. Uh, the older population tends to like that content. The younger population tends to like the USBs and micro SDs, and those are smuggled across the border. Um, and they play them with their little note tells, they're like DVD slash um, little smartphones, basically. Um, and, and then smartphones as well are, are another way and with a micro SD component too. They like them because they're easy to hide if um, if the crackdown squads come. One thing that they do is they used to turn off the electricity on the block and then the crackdown squads would swarm uh, so that you couldn't eject the DVD from your DVD player and they could come and open it up and see. But uh, a micro SD and USB could bloop, quickly take it out. So a lot better for hiding. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. It's an amazing opportunity and I look forward to continue working on this. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Meredith, uh, I'm sorry that you're going to be squeezed a little bit, um, but that's, also there is a, a question in chat uh, that's directed to you to the best you can answer. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Who's the author? Bill Brown. He's talking, the current, ex wait a minute, am I? The current accessibility of North Korean literature uh, he's, he's saying that uh, Kyungju Yonggu, the economic research is no longer being published. Uh, so I guess you could talk about this in terms of your experience in, in getting access to some of these things. Okay, yeah, great. So um, yeah, thank you for first to Ultra for his, his comments. Um, I'm very, very relieved to hear that you agree with me at least that the uh, that these novels are influential enough and you know among a certain limited uh, population i talk in my article a little bit more about you know paper as you mentioned is is in limited supply and and more so now than it was in the past even um, and i actually use that as kind of a justification for saying that these are elite targeted materials as opposed to uh, TV shows and you know other forms of propaganda, so they so that perhaps they're more, uh, you know they they're targeting a, a specific population. But yes, um, I I uh, considered looking at um, I, I look at a few Norong Shin Moon articles and I considered incorporating those uh, a little more. Um, but I, I kind of don't focus on that for two reasons. And one is that I think No Dong Shin Moon is, um, is kind of overanalyzed um, and the articles are fairly short and don't give a lot of context. So, um, you know, my theory is that the, these novels are, are providing the context internally that No Dong Shin Moon articles are very just, you know, the dollar is falling, and and you know the you know the currency crisis is terrible, and but it doesn't give you any details. So um, there's something about a novel where you have a character who is struggling financially, and you kind of see the world through his eyes. That that I think is really important in a country like North Korea, where they don't have that kind of context for like somebody having trouble paying off their mortgage. Um, so, you know, that, but I agree that I should incorporate um, definitely more variety of sources. And I, um, I'm particularly eager to see um, 
if see some uh, teaching materials from inside North Korea, but it's very hard for me to get access to those. I mentioned in a footnote that apparently since last February, uh, Kim Take University has been offering uh, a finance course online in the internal North Korean intranet. And, and I, I really would love to see some of those materials, um, but uh, it's, it's the intranet in North Korea. So I don't know um, it, if you know any sneaky ways of getting around that, please uh, by all means let me know uh, in, the, in the chat. But um, yeah, and uh, just reading more novels and trying to get a grip on this. I'm, I'm pretty limited in how fast I can read these things. But um, I appreciate it. And, and what was uh, Bill Brown's uh, question was about, oh, um, the diminishing publications. Yeah. Um, so I'm reading now uh, all of these online. I used to get them in a library. Um, and now I'm reading all of my materials uh, via Uri Minjo Kiri uh, website, or um, there's another website that has a lot of them. Uh, and that has happened just in the last like two or three well, it's, it's been happening for a while, but it's gotten more plentiful that things are available online now. And I think that's because of the smartphones in North Korea. They're putting more audiobooks out, um, putting more of their old literature out online. So maybe they're not publishing in book form as much anymore. Uh, I think I'm out of time, so I'll open it up to the floor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time uh, for the session and I know it has gotten quite late uh, in Japan and Korea. So I wanna thank the presenters and the discussants. I thought this was just a, a very, very useful session. I wish we had another 30 minutes for it because I think there are a lot of topics we could explore in more depth. Uh, at this point, I wanna turn the mic back uh, to Yangho or Jisoo. Uh, for any concluding comments. And thank you all very much for the opportunity to host this. I really liked it. Uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers today. And um, well, first of all, for these past two days, we've been conducting, um, uh, and there were paper presentations, uh, both uh, on uh, day one and day two. And today uh, in the first session, we had uh, Mr. Began give his um, remarks on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and so I think we had a very uh, productive and fruitful discussions for the two days. And I would like to remind you that uh, this, these papers will be published. Uh, we hope to collect all these papers, excellent papers <laughs> that were presented uh, in these two uh, the past uh, uh, well, yesterday and today. And um, Yono, who is the editor of the uh, NKEF uh, research, uh, policy and research paper series, will uh, be editing uh, all these papers and we hope to publish um, by early next year. <laughs> So these papers will be published through our institute. So uh, those of you um, who have attended uh, our co conference um, this year, uh, and I think some somebody asked in the chat whether these paper, papers will be made available. Yes, uh, not right away, but uh, these paper after, with uh, the great comments that we received yesterday and today will go through a revision process um, and then we we should be able to publish them uh, sometime uh, next year early next year so thank you all for once again for our participants um, and uh, also our attendees and especially I would also like to thank our um, our uh, participants joining us from uh, Korea and Japan, uh, which I know is very late at night over there. So hope you have a, a good uh, rest, <laughs> good night sleep. And uh, thank you once again to everybody for joining uh, this conference. Thank you.